So about a year ago, uh, we convened a, a workshop at Cornell University that was in some ways the progenitor to this workshop, and it was to celebrate uh, Don Farley's 80th birthday. But we had some time left over on the last day, and the question sort of arose, you know, what, what would a moonshot look like uh, in, in the, our discipline in geospace? And uh, so I'm going to present some of the ideas that came out of that, and then uh, some similar themes are going to be discussed uh, in the ensuing session. And, and uh, it, because it was Cornell, the, the answer to the problem was a radar, uh, of course, and uh, but but a different kind of a radar, and uh, and the idea would be uh, you know a radar that would go from from the mud to the sun, and uh, this would be uh, uh, you know a large inquiring scatter class megawatt class radar, but uh, operating at VHF frequencies, you know borrowing on uh, some of the ideas from ISCAD 3D with regards to volumetric uh, uh, imaging and sort of massive um, you know spatial diversity, frequency diversity, uh, polarization diversity, pointing diversity, all of it. And uh, so um, these are sort of uh, the objectives that I talked about this morning. These, these are the same kinds of objectives we had in mind uh, with this, this idea. And so I just sort of want to run through what some of the targets would look like. And some of these are real data. Uh, well, they're all real data uh, acquired from different places. And so, so one thing is if you operate at VHF, you can see index of refraction uh, fluctuations in the neutral atmosphere uh, all the way up to the mesosphere where you start seeing some electrons. And so I'm, I'm just showing some backscatter. And these are from Hikamarka of, uh, uh, you know, um, index of refraction variations in the troposphere uh, and uh, the stratosphere and the mesosphere. And so uh, the resolution here is really quite good. It's, it's, it's tens of meters or something like this. And you see, you know, Kelvin Helmholtz rolls, and you can monitor turbulence, and you can estimate winds, you can estimate momentum fluxes, you can uh, estimate all the sort of holy grails of, of lower middle atmospheric dynamics. And in Hikamarka, you can sometimes see these echoes, and sometimes they're hard to see sort of at the gap uh, between the stratosphere and the mesosphere, with, but with a little bit more power. You can see them all the time, and you can profile all the way from the boundary layer uh, into, the, into the, uh, uh, the, the upper atmosphere. And then if you went up a little bit higher, these are, these are our SIBO data, and these are in current scatter data. But what I'm showing you here are um, uh, neutral wind profiles in the lower thermosphere. And so this is work that Miguel Arson and I do. And these are uh, vector wind profiles, uh, zonal, meridional, and uh, vertical, you know, acquired over, uh, over the, the sunlit hours. And, uh, and so we can uh, look in detail at these flows and uh, estimate stability parameters and learn about the waves that are propagating up from below and to stabilize in the region, giving rise to, uh, to different kinds of uh, you know, instabilities. I should say all of these data are acquired from a fixed point. So they suffer from uh, the inherent problems of, of the fact that we're measuring uh, line of sight velocities only and then inferring everything else through some kind of a, um, a regularization process. But if you did this multi-statically, of course, you'd have uh, true vector winds uh, as well. But you can go up a little bit higher. Oh, by the way, these are plasma drifts in the F region. These are lower thermospheric winds. Uh, if you go up a little bit higher, these are Hikamarka data once again. And these are basic state parameters that you uh, recover from current scatter analysis. So this is electron number density. This is uh, normalized with Faraday rotation down here, <coughs> since we have full polarization control. Uh, electron ion temperatures, uh, H plus fraction, helium fraction. And uh, the altitudes here, well, we, we, we quit at 1,500 kilometers, but we could keep going higher because of, uh, uh, we don't suffer from d a severe Debye length limitations. That allows us to go very low. It also allows us to go very high. And we, and we quit at 1,500 kilometers. We really don't have to, but that's just a, a convenient place to stop. You can go higher, though. And these are 50-year-old these are data, uh, but these are electron number densities up to 10,000 kilometers. And no problem there. You can go right through uh, the plasma sphere, no Debye length limitations. And uh, this is the sort of thing they used to do uh, immediately after opening the observatory. Uh, uh, recently, Marco, Mia, and I revisited this experiment, and it still works. And we can still go to, to 10,000 kilometers. So we have the possibility of, of plasma spheric mapping. Mm -hmm. Are we allowed to ask questions during this or not? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> So there'll be time. There'll be time. So uh, uh, anyway, this is an experiment that Marco and I want to start repeating routinely now. There hasn't been a lot of demand for it, but I think the experiment would create the demand. But you could potentially go higher than that because, uh, oh, uh, let me go back to Arecibo. These are, these are plasma drifts measured at Arecibo. And the reason they look kind of ratty is just because there's so many points that are squeezed together. In fact, they're very clean. And the accuracy is sort of meter per second-ish. 
and uh, uh, there are two feed systems at, at Arecibo, so plasma drifts can be measured very accurately. And the way that they do that is by using uh, frequency diversity. So once the signal noise ratio is above about unity, you stop gaining benefit. And the, what you do is you trade off power for a uh, number of statistically independent samples by running the same experiment at multiple, multiple adjacent frequencies. So that's critical. You know, it's not just power aperture, but it's also the ability to use the frequency spectrum effectively. And Arecibo does that, and they can get uh, you know, sort of meter per second accuracies with a, at a cadence of 30 seconds or something like that uh, by using that, that special technique, which is really quite good. And it's not simply just a matter of power aperture. At Hikamarka, we can get meter per second uh, uh, accuracies not averaging over the whole volume, but in every range gate. And that's what I'm showing here. And I'm showing plasma drifts now up to 1,200 uh, kilometers altitude. And the reason that works is that uh, we can look perpendicular to the magnetic field. And perpendicular to the magnetic field, the incurrent scatter spectrum collapses, becomes very narrow. And these kind of accuracies can be obtained with, with you know, minute type uh, uh, cadences or, or better. Uh, because of that. So uh, for really good uh, drift accuracies, um, you want high power aperture product, frequency diversity, perhaps the ability to look perpendicular to B. Um, and if you have multiple uh, antennas, if you're doing this multi-statically, then you have the possibility also of having additional uh, independent samples. So these are all things that would be desirable. But you can go up higher still. Oh, um, these are just some incurrent scatter spectra. And I want to point out that in addition to utilizing the ion line, uh, there's also the plasma lines and uh, the driver line, and these are being routinely measured now uh, at Arecibo, and that would be something that we'd want to do um, with, uh, with this radar because there's just more information to be extracted that way. So you can go higher still because there's the possibility not only of incoherent scatter but of coherent scatter. So this is the cause celeb uh, of coherent scatter from the equatorial uh, ionosphere. This is equatorial spread F. It's plasma convective instability. And in this case, I'm showing it goes up to about uh, 800 kilometers. And the SNRs here can be you know, uh, 60, 70 dB stronger than, than incoherent scatter. And we observe these not just by measuring power, but we also do um, you know, aperture synthesis imaging the way radio astronomers do it. So we can actually look at uh, how the structures are aligned inside the volume and watch them move around and evolve. And I'll spare you the, uh, uh, the movie um, but if you wanted to see it, I could uh, show you that kind of information later. So that would come from spaced antenna techniques. And I'm sort of imagining now a situation where we'd have uh, multiple, uh, you know, by static or uh, multi-static arrays of receivers, but each one of them would be made up of multiple independent modules, and you form all the, uh, the cross correlations that you can, invert the data, and you get true imagery. But you can go higher still. These are this is coherent scatter from 2,500 kilometers, and uh, and the reason we're seeing it here is because our antenna pointing position that we were using at the time just happened to be close to perpendicular to B at 2,500 kilometers. We don't know how high this goes. We're going to start making a survey, but uh, potentially it goes much higher than this. OK. Uh, but it seems like wherever we look perpendicular to B, we get strong coherent scatter. And so the possibility arises, well, there are electrostatic waves throughout geospace. So these are some cluster observations of, of lower hybrid waves um, uh, at the many deposits at the day side magnetic deposits. And um, you know, the intensities of these waves are sufficiently strong. They're electrostatic. We have the possibility of scattering off of them and using this as a diagnostic for, for a new sphere. But you could go farther still. And so uh, the real idea here is that, uh, that we'll wind up in, on CMEs and the sun. And uh, CMEs, by virtue of having beams in them, should be uh, loaded with electrostatic waves uh, that would give rise to current scatter. And the sun is just a target for reflection. And this isn't a new idea. It's certainly not our idea. This idea has been around for a long time, uh, going back to 1960, and it's been attempted. The solar radar concept has been attempted five, on five different occasions, giving rise to results of varying uh, uh, degrees of, I suppose, uh, success and credibility. And uh, so we're going to hear about some of these results today. Uh, you know, if you work at the power budget, um, it actually turns out not to be so unfavorable just for reflection off of the sun. It's a, it's a one of our squared animal, not a one of our art of the fourth animal. Uh, there's some interesting things about the power budget here. One of them is that the size of the antenna array that you use for reception doesn't figure into it. The solar target is really a strange one. Uh, the sun is the source of the signal. When you scatter off of it, it's also the source of the noise. The noise is much stronger than the signal. The noise comes in the, in the form of, of solar radio bursts. The noise is variable, and the signal is constant. And so you treat them, you sort of invert their roles when you do uh, uh, analysis of the data, and you treat the noise the way you would normally treat the signal and vice versa. Uh, but because um, the, the sun is itself the, the, um, the, the source of noise, if you make the receive antenna smaller, you 
uh, increase the solid angle that you're looking through, but you don't increase the amount of noise that's coming through it. And so you end up with this relationship. And there's some unknowns here, and they're frequency dependent. Uh, L is a loss factor. How, what's the absorption uh, as the signals go through the sun? Uh, this is the solar temperature, the effect of solar temperature, and this is the bandwidth, which depends on the frequency uh, that you would want to operate at. Uh, here's a rather old figure just showing um, uh, the frequency dependence of different kinds of uh, solar radio emissions, including type 3 bursts, which are uh, likely to be among the strongest uh, sources of noise that we'd see uh, during an active sun, which would be the time that we'd be looking. Uh, these are some uh, rough approximations for what the absorption might look like uh, as you penetrate into the sun as a function of frequency, and they're pretty flat, uh, or pretty uniform. Or it doesn't change very much with uh, so much with frequency over the span of frequencies that we'd be looking at. There's a small tendency to increase. And uh, so here I threw together some numbers for the various places where this uh, uh, experiment has been attempted. This is the sort of SNR you might expect for the experiment that was run, and these numbers are maybe debatable, and we're, we're debating them still. And this is the number of independent, uh, statistically independent samples that you would be required to make a detection uh, for that degree of accuracy, which is not very good. But it gives you an idea how these problems scale. And uh, these experiments have been attempted at Hikamarka, and uh, they were not, have not been successful so far, but we are going to revisit that problem. Uh, it appears as though they were uh, successful at Arecibo, and so Don Campbell is going to report on that result. So far as we can tell, the data look pretty good. And the question for El Campo, I guess, is a, under a little bit of um, scrutiny uh, right now. It certainly looked like a very solid uh, result for quite a bit of time, although Bill Coles, after doing his work at Hikamarka, he and his co-authors um, found reason to be a little bit skeptical. But anyway, this is the proposal. I mean, the idea here is that this would be a, this would be a, a radar for all of geospace, uh, capable of looking at uh, all the signals of interest to the geospace community. Uh, so we're thinking about you know a large ISR class radar, maybe 50 megahertz, something like that, something above the maximum usable frequency, but not much. You know, try static to get uh, bearing, um, maybe 10,000 elements per array, picomarca sized, something like an LWA uh, build out for for receivers, something like that. Um, megawatt class transmit, high duty cycle, uh, lots of uh, 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 frequency diversity here so that we can get the optimum trade off, keep SNRs around Unity. Uh, true vector drift profiles at all altitudes, aperture synthesis imaging, much as uh, Hikamarka has and ISCAD 3D will have. Uh, exploit frequency pointing and spatial uh, diversity wherever possible. To deal with um, solar radio bursts, we would use adaptive beamforming. And uh, so that would allow us to suppress while simultaneously studying uh, the signals that are coming from uh, the radio bursts. And of course, you don't have to receive one thing with the receiver. You can receive all things. You could be doing a radar experiment while looking at solar radio bursts, while looking at meteor echoes, while using this as a passive radar, listening to backscatter from a radio station. All of these things you can do simultaneously. You can look at all points along the, emitted, uh, the illuminated volume simultaneously and get true profiles from them simultaneously, et cetera, et cetera. This would allow you to see meteor echoes, the MST region, the ionosphere, plasmosphere, perhaps the radiation belts, magnetosphere, the solar wind, CMEs, and the sun. And it's, uh, it's really the ultimate integration strategy with a, a space weather forecast capability if you really could have range bearing and Doppler on, on uh, CMEs, and, uh, and it falls into pasture's quadrant. So that was the proposal. And um, since then, some of us have been thinking about how this, uh, if this is feasible and how it might look. And uh, this session uh, is in part uh, a response, not entirely, but in part a response to this idea. And so that's what we want to listen to. So um, our first talk is going to be Joha Vjarnin. And the uh, normal rules will apply here. <coughs> Can I find your talk? Okay, um, thank you. So I'm going to show some pretty images which basically go over through some of the th same things that they've already talked about. Um, um, and I've, I've been somewhat, somehow, somewhat involved in this stuff. Uh, I've used most of the ISRs in the world, and, and there are two discovery class radars, in, in my opinion. There's Arecibo and then there's Hikamarka. And I guess this is my take on what is Hikamarka 2.0 or what's the What's the next generation Hikamarka? What is it? What can it do? And obviously, um, 
there exist there exist low frequency radio telescope technology. Um, there's the LWA an antenna on the right. You combine that with a high power large aperture radiator, um, preferably one that's somewhat frequency agile. And then you've got a ra radar. I mean, radio and radio astronomers will balk at this when you when you mention a high power radiator, but I think it's a good idea. And um, I'm calling it LOF right here. Okay, so what could you do, do with this? I mean, the f first thing that you could do with it is you would announce it as a radio science playground. And all, anyone to come up with weird, crazy ideas how to use it. Um, of, co of course, um, one cool thing to look at is, is try to revisit the solar radar idea. Um, if this radiator is frequency agile, you can explore the dimension that's not very often explored with radar, you, um, the K, the K space. If you have a, most of the stuff that we look at has, has interesting aspects um, on the frequency dimension. Um, if it's tristatic, you can, uh, you're always getting volumetric um, three-dimensional vector fields, which are not done, done that often. Uh, ISCA 3D is proposing to do this, and, and I, th I think Lofrad should, should do this too. Uh, it's, if, if it's a low frequency radar, as, as, as it's intended to be, um, it, it, it will have very good penetration properties into the, into the moon, and, and the moon is probably the only planetary body that we can study with it, but I think we could do it pretty well. For meteor head echoes, it would be an amazing instrument because it's multi-static. It will allow you to unambiguously de determine where the trajectories are, and there's, there's a lot of controversy right now especially with meteors on, on are there high altitude meteors or are they aliased or are they in the side lobes? Uh, this instrument would resolve this completely. Um, and then you could do magnetospheric radar. Uh, Phil is going to talk about that. So here's, uh, last night I, I drew this after the fire alarm at, at Millennium and um, <laughs> just tried to do a pretty picture of, of things that we could uh, reach out to. Um, obviously, there's a lot of stuff that we can expand. We, we can do be much better if we can do fully three-dimensional vector velocities, um, starting from the troposphere all the way up to the top side. Um, meteor head echoes, as I said, this would be a, probably almost as sensitive as Arecibo, but it would have unambiguous trajectories. And for solar radar, I mean, this is in a way a ninazon. This is a total reflection instrument. It, it, the radio wave propagates to the sun and where, where the radio wave meets the, the, the plasma frequency in, in the solar corona, you get a total reflection. And um, depending on what frequency you use, you, you might um, have some absorption. So you, you don't want to have a too high frequency because absorption will kill it, but you don't want it to be too low because then you can't get out of the ionosphere. So this is a picture of solar radar. Um, this, this is from uh, this nice diagram from Rodriguez, actually. All right, I don't, I don't think who I don't know who originally did this. The topic is controversial. I don't think anyone agrees uh, yet on, on has anyone ever done a successful solar radar experiment. I think we could try to redo it and 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 maybe get a positive result. And there's a lot of interest in the community. There's a lot of names who, who've written proposals to do this in the past. For meteors, so for meteors, because it's a low frequency, here's a picture from close at all. Um, the lower you go in wavelength, the, the longer the wavelength, the, the larger the radar cross section for a meteor head echo. So it, just the, the frequency itself would, would create a sensitive instrument, and combined with the huge power and aperture, it, it would and, and the multi-static nature, this would be the ideal meteor head echo survey instrument. <coughs> Lunar. Um, the longest wavelength map of the moon that I know of is Thompson, uh, 1978. He used 7.5 megahertz at Arecibo. We, we could try to redo this. Um, their signal processing had, has advanced a lot. And, and um, 7.5 meters, yeah. Oh, sorry, 40, 40 megahertz. And, and uh, we could do better focusing, better, uh, better mapping, and, and see what's underneath the lunar regolith. And it has been done before, so this is why my PhD was delayed two years. Um, I proposed to buy a LOFAR station, a LOFAR radio telescope, and, and do ionospheric remote, radio remote sensing with it. And 
the only pr idea we had at first was let's use it as a bi-static phased array receiver for the ISCID VHF, and it worked. But then once we got a million dollars of money, we had to figure out the science case. So one, one night I sat down and I, I thought of all kinds of cool, cool experiments that we could do with this. And, and we've gone and, and done a lot of this. We've done 200 megahertz wide scintillation, ra ra radio scintillation measurements um, uh, with um, Richard Fowles, Bill Coles. Uh, we operated as a wide band imaging rheometer. And um, it's, very, it's, it's probably the most, I would say it's the best imaging rheometer in the world because it's, it's broadband. You, we can even measure the frequency dependence of absorption and get a little bit of, of information on inverting the electron density profile in the D region. We've done heating experiments with this. Uh, we can see specular me meteor trails. And because it's, it's a broadband instrument, it goes between 10 and 250 megahertz, we can see a lot of different radiators which are, are nearby. We can, for example, see Cokie's Marcy radar. And, and, and a bunch of other radars. So it's, it's a truly a, a K-sensing radar receiver. And, and boy, if we had a powerful frequency agile radiator and, and, and maybe three of these receivers with a lot more collecting area, what, what could we do? That's it. Oh, there's one more slide. Um, we can also opt the frequency and, and uh, have a high frequency radiator and, and Connect it with SKA, and we could call it SCARAT. Okay, thanks, Juha. See, next on the program is Don Campbell. We'll take us on a walk down memory lane. I'm dying to know what the answer is. Do you know how to put that into um, movie mode? Oh, is it this one? No, uh, there, yeah, there it is. Yeah. There we go. Uh -huh. Well, this is at uh, Dave's urging. Uh, I visited my office one day and saw some uh, results that, uh, that I'd obtained as a graduate student uh, back in 1966 and an attempt to detect uh, 40 megahertz radar uh, echoes from the sun. Um, so it's probably the most unusual talk I've given in terms of the age of the data, which has been sitting in a file cabinet, uh, well, many file cabinets probably in, uh, since uh, over the years. Uh, it's also a little depressing in the sense that, apart from the Hickamaka experiments that Dave referred to and several attempts by Paul Rodriguez at HF frequent, uh, using HF facilities to detect radar echoes from the sun, there really hasn't been any serious uh, effort to, uh, to do solar radar since the 1960s. Um, and just to show you, the, <coughs> we've got a pointer here somewhere. Um, it's just a picture of what Arecibo looked like um, back in the 1960s. Uh, there was a 40, uh, for between 1965 and approximately 1971, there was a 40 megahertz radar on the system intended originally for incoherent scattered radar measurements. The, um, the transmitter uh, could put, it was in the operations building, could put out two megawatt peak power or 100 kilowatt average power, but it could also run in CW mode and put out about 100 kilowatts or so. It, uh, the power was carried by a six inch coaxial line up the uh, catwalk here, down through the structure and out to this feed system, which is four Yagi antennas in a sort of square array around the 430 megahertz, uh, the then 430 megahertz uh, line feed. Um, <clears throat> there were three different attempts uh, about that time to detect solar radars, one uh, by the Stanford group under von Eschelman at 26.5 megahertz, one the El Campo attempt, which was the most comprehensive uh, effort by far to do uh, solar radar from 1961 to 1969 and at 38 megahertz and then Arecibo attempt by myself in 1966 as a graduate student and then by Alan Parrish the following year who was also a graduate student at Cornell and we just, it was a great time, the, these instruments were out on the telescope, you could sort of get the time and do whatever you felt like doing, it had nothing to do with thesis research. Um, the, uh, this just shows you the solar cycle relative to the, uh, these experiments. This is the Stanford one at the peak of the solar cycle here, the El Campo one from 61 to 69, bracketing 
part of this solar cycle and part of this one and going through solar minimum. And the Arecibo uh, efforts were in 1966 and 67, uh, right very close, just after the minimum of the, of the solar cycle. The uh, <clears throat> radar systems were Stanford at 25, 40 kilowatts, 10 again about 25, not just a, an array with no tracking capability in uh, several, these are the good dates for the, uh, for the data in 1959. El Campo at 38.2, 500 kilowatts, gain around, peak gain of 36 at Zenith, uh, since, it had to, since it was a fixed array, uh, with a beam width of about six and a half degrees in the east-west direction, uh, it sort of declined in sensitivity uh, uh, over the half hour of the transmit receive time to the sun. So the average was probably around more like 34 dB. And Arecibo at 40.1 megahertz. Uh, fortunately, the transmitter had been just tuned up at that time and so put out the 400 kilowatts when I was using the 66. And unfortunately for Alan Paris, the following year it declined to about uh, 50, uh, 50 kilowatts. So I'm going to talk about the results that I obtained, uh, partly because of this rather large difference in the sensitivities and, uh, at the time. The um, <clears throat> 1966 uh, power 100 kilowatts, the waveform was just a frequency switch waveform switching across 40 kilohertz. Uh, with a 60 second period, 30 seconds on one frequency, 30 seconds on the other, receive band with 20 kilohertz. Tracking time nominally is 160 minutes, although looking, looking at the data, there's really only on two days where there are two runs, and the other days there's only one, for reasons that I have no idea uh, at this point. Unfortunately, the log books were, I'm about to say inadvertently, but that isn't quite true, thrown out in the early 1990s, um, and so uh, quite a lot of the information is lost. Um, and then Alan Paris did it in 1967 over 14 days, but the power, as I said, was reduced significantly. Uh, this is just showing you what the general scheme is, and I can really go into through it. There's two 20 kilohertz filters here corresponding to the two, uh, two frequencies. Um, <coughs> There were ADD converters, square law detectors, ADD converters, and then you had a subtractor that just subtracted the waveforms, giving you a nominally a square wave, the absence of any noise. That was correlated with one cycle of the period, and that would give you this sort of triangular shaped wave uh, corresponding uh, to a sort of point, a point reflector. Um, the data looked like this. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, you can see, this is the nominal uh, ideal echo in this dashed line here. This is the true, uh, true echo here. This was a noise burst uh, from the sun that was significantly affecting the, the data, obviously. And that's a correlation from a one minute uh, shift cycle. And just out of interest, this is what the uh, Stanford group got. A very similar looking, same system by the way, as a graduate student, I just copied essentially what they were doing, what they had done. And this looks very similar to what the Arecibo results uh, were. And if you then correlate with the full length of the, uh, of the transmitted signal, you end up essentially averaging each of these uh, cycles. You end up, and when they average over three days, one run per day, they ended up with this uh, triangular waveform here that looks pretty convincing, frankly. Um, Arecibo uh, doing exactly the same thing. You ended up with, again, a triangular uh, sort of waveform here for the data. And uh, this, there were three runs here just using, looking at the noise from the sun, in other words, no transmission. And so, you know, it's a moderately convincing looking, uh, looking echo. Um, the, um, this is just the echo from another day. Uh, these are the um, correlation with the single waveform. This is the average of them all. Uh, very rather convincing again looking, uh, looking echo. For those of you who are old enough, you'd probably recognize a Calcom plot. Um, all these plots were made uh, uh, back in 1966, as you might have noticed from the megacycle per second that was, uh, that was on the plots rather than megahertz. Um, before looking to the future, I was going to comment um, that the, there has been some skepticism on this, certainly on the Stanford results and certainly on the, and also by some people on the Ocampo results. 
the Ocampo results, uh, we're talking about a very extended set of observations. And, you know, frankly, I'm far from convinced that they're not real. Um, they have very consistent results. Uh, the echoes come in at the expected, uh, roughly the expected time, time each, each day or each observation uh, that we see. And so they look pretty convincing to, uh, as far as I'm concerned. The Stanford ones uh, correspond to a, um, a cross section of s somewhere in the sort of 50 to 40 to what 70, uh, I think, in that plot, you know, is roughly times the physical cross section of the, uh, um, of the uh, photosphere, which is really high value. But the El Campo people also got extremely high values when they were partly um, during their early observations when the solar cycle was still relatively, activity was still relatively high. El Campo, sorry, the Stanford people did it at the peak of that solar cycle. And so it's a little hard to tell whether, in fact, the Stanford results were believe or potentially believable or, or not. Um, the, uh, looking to the future, um, Arecibo's big advantage is that it's, uh, that it's a steerable, a huge aperture that's steerable. You can actually track the sun for two and a half hours. Um, it could be equipped with a transmitter, perhaps somewhere in the 25 to 40 megahertz uh, range. Uh, the coaxial line that goes to the platform is uh, partially in place, and the, the large part of it is still in storage. So that's uh, that's uh, one sort of cost that would be avoided. A new feed would be required. A transmitter in the 200 to say 500 kilowatt CW, um, sorry CW transmitter would be would be needed. And of course, we'd have to sort of decide really what are the optimum frequencies and are there allowed frequency assignments uh, for the ones that are desirable. And so some sort of funding for a detailed feasibility study and cost estimate is, um, sorry, that's doubled up there, is, uh, is, uh, is, is really needed. And of course, the issue at the moment for Arecibo, as you're all, I'm sure, well aware, it isn't all clear uh, what the future of the, uh, what the observatory will be over the next few years. Thank you. So, Kevin Staval is next on the program. Do you have any hand drawn plots? No. Oh, <laughs> that's a pity. It's a very pity. Okay. You know how to make that play? Uh, This. Hello everyone, I'm Kevin Stovall, <laughs> so I'm a postdoc at University of New Mexico and I work with the Long Wavelength Array. So I was going to give an overview of what the Long Wavelength Array is and then some of the science results that we've done so far that may interest you guys and then talk about um, if we built out a full long wavelength array, some of the other science we might get in addition to radar. Right. So to describe LWA, I will first describe a station that exists. We call this the first station, or LWA1. Um, so this consists of 256 dipoles arranged in uh, 100 meters by 110 meter ellipse. There are also five antennas that are a few hundred meters away. They range from, I think, 300 to 500 meters away. They're not shown in the picture. The uh, frequency range for this instrument is 10 to 88 megahertz. Um, and there are multiple modes of operation. So our, um, one of the modes is to do beam forming. So you can point um, four independent beams. So you can point anywhere in the sky. They don't depend on one another. Each of these beams have what we call two tunings, meaning two frequency ranges. These are also independent. So you could put one at the top part of the frequency band, one at the bottom. Um, they all, we get dual polarization and you can get full stokes out of them. You can do up to 19.6 megahertz of bandwidth per beam, and, and that's per tuning, I mean. So per tuning per beam. Um, and let's see, another way that we use LWA1 is we can do all sky imaging. 
So you take all of the array and do a correlation at one frequency, which has a few uh, tens of kilohertz of bandwidth. Um, and then we have one other mode where we can capture all of the spectra, or the spectra from all of the antennas, but you can only do this for about 50 milliseconds, and then you have to wait a few minutes before you can do it again. Um, we have already built a second station, so, so the long wavelength array would be to build about 50 such stations. Um, we have built a second station already, which we call LWA Sevieta. Um, this is located 30 kilometers north of Socorro, um, which is about 70 kilometers northeast of LWA1. Um, one of the changes that we have made is you can go slightly lower in frequency. It can go down to 3 megahertz rather than cut off of 10. Um, we expect to be able to do very similar th stuff with LWA1, but we are currently commissioning and developing all the back-end software. Um, it has, over the past few weeks, it's been uh, recording the TBN mode, so doing the all-sky imaging. So that mode, we've just got working. We're working on the beam forming and the TBW mode. Another thing of interest is that the VLA has recently begun to be outfitted with four-band uh, antennas. So there's this um, square that's located on about 12 antennas, I believe. Um, this is called a modified J-pole, and it's active from 50 to 80 megahertz. Um, it has wider bandwidth this, than the previous um, 74 megahertz system. Um, with just the, uh, the VLA antennas, you can get a re resolution of 20 arc seconds. And we are currently working on getting the two LWA stations working with the VLA. We took a few observations last year and have um, some images of the Crab Nebula and stuff like that. Uh, but we're still figuring everything out. So, all right. So, oh, sorry. So going on to science that we can do. Can I go back? Okay, there we go. Um, so this is science that we've done with uh, the LWA1 station only. So it's been operational for about four years, so we've had some time to play with it and do some things. Um, so one of the things we did was uh, observe a pulsar, which is shown as this yellow dot here. So it's about four and a half degrees away from the sun at this time. And so I have this GIF where, um, so we have, what we did was we knew where this pulsar was, and we had Tim Howard from SWRI here in Boulder. He would look at LASCO images, and if it looked like there was a CME coming off the south side headed towards the pulsar, I would activate the LWA and we would observe it as long as we can. So on August 21st, we caught a fairly good CME which headed towards um, and the pulsar, unfortunately, we had to cut off observations about the time that it got there due to lightning in the area. But anyway, um, the data from this observation, so I show we're, we're able to do full stokes um, of this. And so we looked for Faraday rotation. This is what we got for the rotation measure uh, from the pulsar data. So we basically took um, the pulsar figured out what the rotation measure is. Some of this is, of course, due to the galaxy. So what we're looking for is some sharp change about the time that the CME arrived, which was in this range. Fortunately, it's pretty flat. We are not considering this to be a detection of uh, Faraday rotation due to the CME. What we believe all of the structure is due to is the ionosphere. Um, here is... Uh, so typically what you do is you try to model the total electron content and figure out what the magnetic field is, combine those two, and come up with a model for the ionosphere. So that's what's shown here. And this is what you do when you subtract this from this. Um, and it's pretty flat. You see some wiggles, but we don't think this is a detection. We think this is um, us not monitor or not able to correct for the ionosphere as well as we'd like. So a few things to point out is these have error bars on them. These are very, very, very tiny error bars. So we get um, measurements of, that are of the level of 0 0.005 radians per meter squared. That's the size of our error bars. And unfortunately, the ionosphere pretty much completely removes all that. So the, the error bars on those measurements is about 0.1 radians per meter squared. However, one good result from this is shown up here. So this shows what we call the dispersion measure 
which is the integrated electron density along the line of sight to the pulsar. <laughs> Thank you. So some of this is due to the galaxy, but about the time that the CME arrives, you see an increase. So we do think that this is us actually seeing change in electron density due to the CME. So another thing that we've done uses the, uh, <clears throat> the all-sky imaging. So this is the TBN. We have recently detected emission from meteors high in the atmosphere and not reflections. So this shows a spectrum from one of these. So what we did was we put uh, three beams straight up and then at some point we detected a meteor that went directly overhead and then we looked at these beams, went up to the right time, we removed all of these places. So these are where transmitters are. So reflections off of this occurred in these pl places that are removed. What's left was the spectrum of meteors. So um, if you're interested in this, there are a few papers that we published over the last few years. Um, so now I'm gonna move into, so I'm taking the slot of Joe Hembolt, who was originally gonna come here, so I'm gonna talk about what you could potentially do with an LWA type, a full LWA type thing, or uh, one application. So one of the things you can do is uh, basically use bright radio sources to uh, monitor the ionosphere. So as the plane wave comes in, it hits the ionosphere, and you'll get differential uh, delays that are added due to differential tech values. And so you could basically sit and monitor bright sources and figure out what the ionosphere is doing as you point at these. Um, so this is showing a few things. So this was taken with the V-Light, uh, which is um, a commensal system on the VLA. So it's at P-band, so it's always recording data. So you kind of follow along whatever um, people are observing with the VLA. Um, and on one observation of SIGA, or is it CASA? I'm, I don't remember. But anyway, they, they were able to um, see these uh, traveling ionospheric disturbances, which were mostly in the southwest direction. And down here, they took the uh, GPS receivers near within about 200 kilometers of the VLA and did a similar thing. So they also observed this, um, these TIDs. Um, with a similar velocity. But one thing to note is that these are at uh, different uh, wavelengths of the TIDs. And another recent result using the MWA shows uh, field aligned irregularities moving through. Um, these are maps done with V light soon after. So this shows MWA results showing these field aligned irregularities. Um, so just my closing remarks. Uh, we do have two stations of the LWA, and there's also a system at the VLA. We can begin to look into doing imaging with all these combined. Um, LWA is currently doing some geospace projects, but we could do more if people here are interested in any of the stuff we do. And uh, as far as what Joe Himboldt wanted to say, if we one of the drawbacks of what is done with monitoring the radio sources and getting ionospheric information. There's no system which sits there monitoring all of these bright sources. And he proposes that we could do such a thing with a full LWA, just set a beam on SIGA, CASA, a few other bright sources, and always study the ionosphere. Thanks, Joe. Thanks. 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 That brings up Namir Kasim. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'd like to say a few words uh, about uh, a solar radar uh, receiver or array, what it would look like. A lot of thanks to uh, Bill Coles, Koki, Chow is here, uh, Brett Isham, who's in the audience. And uh, the, the most important point, so Bill Coles really talked me through a lot of this stuff. He has a lot more experience, obviously. You guys probably never heard of, heard of me in this, in this audience. Um, Bill said the most important point to get across was that um, in a solar radar experiment um, with an imaging array, let's say, the, the cost of the transmitter will dominate the cost of the instrument. And 
The technology for the receiving array is pretty much in hand. It's been developed for instruments like LOFAR and LWA and MWA. You'd have to rearrange things, but you don't have to reinvent a lot of the wheels. And so that's really the important point, that uh, it's, it's going to be inexpensive and fairly straightforward to develop. No, no new technology will be needed. The, the political question is, can you guys come up with a a reason to build the transmitter independent of wanting to do solar radar, and my guess is you probably could. But you, you do need a, a powerful transmitter. You don't want to sort of do the experiments at the levels that were done before. You've got to do much better. So fortunately, a lot of this material has really been covered. Um, this is Paul Rodriguez's cartoon. It just the, Again, the, the simple-minded thing here is if you can, with a two-dimensional imaging array, which is a little different than looking at it like with a single dish, you know, you get the transverse velocity, get the Doppler, uh, get the radio from the Doppler velocity. With Faraday rotation, you, you learn something about the magnetic field of, of the CME if you're lucky enough to, to get you know, the CME as part of the echo. So that's kind of the holy grail. Then you could put these systems all around the Earth and they could just be bombarding the sun all the time, and you get you know accurate geomagnetic storm prediction, despite what you know. Then I learned, for instance, this morning, then it doesn't even help if you can figure out what the CME is doing at the sun. It's all going to change on the way here. <laughs> but setting that aside, obviously this would be a, a very powerful uh, new technique uh, for for space weather prediction. And then this is just kind of fun over here. We already Tim discussed uh, his own. Uh, observation over here. This is an array that may not be too different from what we might want to eventually do. This is an LWA station that was mentioned this morning that Greg Hallen and developed at Caltech. I guess Dale Gary mentioned it. And this just helped me get my, get my head around sort of what's going on here. So here's the corona. Uh, so it's, it's, it's much brighter than the galactic background. It's like 300, three times 10, uh, 300,000 degrees Kelvin. That's very important. That's the reason why you end up with this sort of scenario where the, the collecting area of the receiver doesn't play into it as much. Then about 10 minutes later, off goes this noise storm. And so it, it's like 30 dB or more higher than, the, than the, the corona. And that's why everything else, you don't have the dynamic range to see the rest. And then as the noise storm dies down, um, about an hour later, you start to see the corona again. And then Greg thought he was seeing what Tim was seeing here, the synchrotron emission from the CME there. You can see it in Alaska. Uh, Stephen was saying that's, eh, he's not really convinced that that's the case. But this is almost like, this is sort of what the solar radar problem is. In other words, you can see it all here. You need dynamic range, okay, to deal with this noise storm that apparently are always going off at similar times as CMEs. And then you need angular resolution. That's the one thing that would take you another step beyond like what's been done with Arecibo or, or Hickamarca, even if those things had more powerful transmitters. You want to have enough angular resolution to, to, see, you know, to separate the noise storm from the echo. Uh, so there's too much here. I'll just, just um, you know, we sort of talked through these, um, me and Koki and Bill, and, and we don't even agree on all these, but I think, you know, we certainly everybody agrees on the frequency range. Antenna elements, you might as well use one, you know, on a low far or low uh, uh, LWA. They're, they're far too broadband, but that's okay, because you probably want to have the flexibility to try this experiment at different frequencies, plus you'd want to use those antennas as part of an instrument doing something else. You definitely need the dual polarization to get the Faraday rotation. Bandwidth, of course, is very small by typical radio astronomy standards. You know, you may tr transmit a very narrow band signal, but when you, you know, with the Doppler and the frequency shift keying and all these things, I don't really understand about radar. You, you may end up with having to detect the megahertz or something. This is crucial. You need a few arc minutes. Angular resolution, that tells you right off the bat you need five kilometers, 10 kilometers. Um, and then because of Dave actually described this this morning about why, you know, rel if you design it, it correctly, you know, that you can make the sensitivity independent of the collecting area of the receiving antenna, and you can convince yourself that you need less than a thousand dipoles or so. That, that then tells you that the transmitter is going to dominate. So you've got to worry about getting the funding for that. Don't worry so much about the receiver. Uh, the back end is, again, kind of a, not b a big deal because the bandwidth is so uh, relatively small. Um, so you bring it all, all the signal back to some place, and you can do incoherent imaging, which is probably what you need for the echoes, but you could also do coherent imaging for other applications. Uh, you're, you'd be making these photos, like let's say every 100 milliseconds or something, so that's what's you know, sort of different about the radar. Here's the dynamic range. Dave mentioned the nulling. 
um, and uh, modeling. I mean, I, th I think this is an area which is where experiment led, um, right? These guys started, it was a very creative idea to go out there and bombard the sun, but you know, when Jesse James started this, they hardly knew about the solar wind, certainly didn't know about CMEs. Now you guys know so much more, you should be able to do a much better job of modeling it. Um, and again, this is the point that Bill wanted me to emphasize that you know a lot of the technology has really been done. You just need to sort of reconfigure things. This was sort of um, just a back of the envelope thing where I got all tied up trying to convince myself about this independent of the re collecting area of the receiver business. And I tried to I, I tried to understand this, and I was calculating how many dipoles. It turns out you can't use one dipole or two dipoles, so that you do have to have some <laughs> collecting area in the receiver. But the point is, you need to have enough. So that, you're, so that the side lobes um, uh, uh, balance the response of the galactic background against the solar noise. And then after that, if you add more dipoles, it doesn't do you any good. And I did sort of a very simple calculation here. It came up with about 700 dipoles. I don't even that's if it's right or wrong. But at least I didn't get a million dipoles or 10,000 dipoles or, or three dipoles. Um, also, this type of calculation um, is, signal to, is about the signal to noise. And what's more important is like what Dave was saying, if you're gonna do things like nulling to try to null out the um, noise storm or some of the imaging tricks we use in radio astronomy where we often have cases of big woofly things where we have to remove bright, bright point sources, you need, that's where having a lot of elements gives you versatility. So you may end up needing more elements just to play those kind of tricks. And I'll just end here with a straw man concept so um, this is inspired by Kalgoor, I do a circle, but if you just look at this Y, so an inverted Y, you know, that's like obviously a common concept. 10 kilometers in size, so maybe 100 or 200 elements on each arm separated by about 100 meters, get you a few arc minute angular resolution. You could use either a LOFAR or LWA or whatever dipole. Now that's kind of what your system would look like. Um, so really be relatively inexpensive. And uh, Bill's idea was this would be, if you guys are going to build, build some you know, much more capable system, this would be some nested kind of narrow band system that could just sit inside of that. Um, and, and then I also tried to think about what do we have on the ground now that could be used. And I tried not to you know, get too caught up in that. I mean, we do need to look at, I think, like the LOFARC uh, central chirp area could be used as a possible receiver. LWA1 maybe is a single pixel receiver. I'm not sure about that. But the point is there's not enough angular resolution in that one station. So I had the one idea we had was, well, well, maybe you could sprinkle around a lot of dipoles. And that's how you could get your resolution. So that'd be very cheap. So there I'm, I'm pretty much finished. I just wanted to finish with uh, three uh, uh, philosophical points. Uh, the first one is don't get yourself into the, I don't think you're going to do this, but the, the radio astronomers have gotten themselves into a, a problem at low frequencies where they've got this kind of transformational science thing called the epic of reionization. And that's kind of been the tail that's wagging the, the dog. And um, people expected that they would, demonstrators would detect it, and now people aren't detecting it. So it makes, it puts your whole grand facility at risk. So in other words, I don't think you want to build your grand facility here for solar radar, and I don't think you guys are going to do that. You want the solar radar to be kind of some gem that if you get it, it'd be this really great thing, but you don't want the facility to be built just to do that. And then uh, the second thing was, um, you know, you'll inevitably, if you were doing it, it sort of related to that, you know, if you did want to like throw in all these millions of dollars just for solar radar, people are going to demand some sort of a demo. Be careful of that. That's one of the problems with some of the recent efforts, like taking some of these OTH systems that are at too low a frequency, that are pointed at the horizon, which is not how you want to do so. So you end up with some two sigma result. That just, then we have to wait another 30 years to try it again. So if you're going to do it, do it right. And I think Bill, and one thing we did all agree on, it's all about the transmitting power. And Don emphasized that too. You know, Make a, a leap of at least a factor of five or 10 over what's been done before. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that was about it. Thanks. Okay, Frank. That's for you. Thank you. So our next speaker is Frank Lind. All right, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the speakers for setting up my talk so well. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, 
what I think we can do with next generation geospace arrays. And I, I differentiate this from radars. Um, it includes DAISY as an array. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about where we're going. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, I lead a lot of the engineering at MIT Haystack Observatory, including the Geospace Facility Program. I actually have the only projects, couple projects right now in our array program, which came out of MWA development. And uh, I keep doing things lately that look like I'm an astronomer almost. So it's kind of disturbing that my science isn't stovepiped anymore. Um, and I think that's been a huge problem for our community. I mean, I've been, I've been privileged to work with so many brilliant people in so many areas. And that includes, uh, includes AMISER development. It includes uh, LOFAR, which became MWA. Uh, and uh, I think that where we're going is a very interesting future if we're willing to grasp it and move forward. And a lot of the things we inherited from the past are aging. And uh, you know, a lot of my early interest in this, I got to Millstone Hill, and it was pretty obvious to me we need a new instrument at some point. And at the time, it seemed very immediate. We only had a few klystrons left. Uh, that situation resolved itself, kind of. Um, but I began looking at how to build radio arrays that might do what we want, because I was involved with LOFAR, and I was listening to all these wonderful things radio arrays could do. And I, I do it put out a preceding publication at the last day of the last session of one of the Ursi International meetings. And uh, it was a drawing of this experiment that Yuha and Derek went and did uh, quite a bit of time later. And uh, these radio arrays are the basis of next generation geospace radar and radio observation. They weren't produced by our community per se. Many of us had some input. But uh, the underlying technology is profoundly possible. And it's enabled by software radio underneath. And we have so been doing software radar at Millstone for uh, over a decade and a half now. And so radar and, and, and radio astronomy are all converging via software. And we've kick-started at MIT Haystack a number of cyber infrastructure-like programs to, to look at how to scale these uh, types of systems to incredibly large data flows. Uh, we can build systems now that produce millions of times as much data as any one of these existing instruments. Um, and handling that data is going to be an incredible challenge. Um, so this is the starting point. We've got MWA, we've got Kyra and uh, the LOFAR systems. Uh, this is Square Kilometer Array. This is the next effort in the astronomy community. And um, they're planning a modest demonstrator of 100,000 antennas. Um, OK, and then they want to build a million. So uh, we looked a little bit at how to leverage this, and that turned into a project called RAPID. Now, I'll talk about that in a second. The key thing for us as a community to look at is how to get the most science out of any aperture we build. We're talking about taking a lot of other people's money, providing some flimsy justification potentially, okay, and going forward and spending it to build instruments to do science that interests us as individuals and as a community. And you know, when we have all our little individual interests, those interests tend to be very compartmentalized. It's the thing you're working on. It's the thing that excited you last week. You had a conversation with a colleague. And the infrastructure we build when we want to spend a lot of money to do it needs to be much more capable. And it needs to be comprehensive. And it really needs to be sun to mud. And you know, we really ought to even do some astronomy, OK? There's co all these things have been demonstrated. Every one of our facilities has done so something along different aspects of these, these techniques. You've got lower atmosphere measurements, MST. Uh, if you go up to higher frequencies, you can do things that look like weather radar if you're up at 3 gigahertz. Uh, you've got all the incoherent scatter measurements. Of course, we, we have a whole series of incoherent scatter radars, none of which are quite what we want. Arecibo is this incredible instrument that produces things we may never be able to afford to produce again. But nevertheless, we may need to move forward uh, with the direction things are going, try to find a way to do things more affordably. Uh, the solar measurements, this is MWA solar data. Um, and we've seen a number of L LWA things, as well as the, the kind of comprehensive idea of what we might do. There's interplanetary scintillation, which a whole series of telescopes have contributed to. Even our, even our Millstone Hill radar has, has done some IPS measurements, thanks to UHA, not 
stove piping his interests. Um, MST, uh, it turns out LOFAR has been doing wonderful work detecting cosmic rays and, uh, and characterizing their energy and their, uh, their cascade of particles that comes out from the EMPs that they produce on very short time scales. Uh, this is a UHF radar measurement from Millstone that Yuha did of, of the moon. Uh, other radars have, of course, also done this, uh, as well as with other planets occasionally, um, if you have a little bit more aperture. And this is an MWA picture of the galactic plane. And so there's, these instruments are all the same instrument. Okay, I've been building these things for a long time now. They're all looking the same. We can digitize everything. If you, if you digitize everything and you have a really big memory, you can keep everything for long time scales. If the bandwidth is narrow enough that you want to store, you can store it practically forever. And so we can think about building arrays that do profoundly different things than they have in the past. Uh, the other thing is a lot of times you think about building software behind these and making them do one thing. They can actually, in many cases, do all these things simultaneously. Uh, if you configure the arrays properly to support, say, solar imaging as well as a concentrated central array for radar, then you can actually build systems that perform well for all these things. So RAPID was one of our uh, projects that were, is ongoing. We're currently integrating this. The idea was to take square kilometer array antennas, work with the Cambridge Astrophysics Group. Uh, we helped them improve the antennas quite a bit, as well as um, we wanted to put a solar powered data system on each antenna with solid state memory buffer. When I started this project, I could maybe put a terabyte on every unit. And if I had the money, I could put 32 terabytes on every unit. We're going to make of order 100, you know, 50 to 100. Uh, was what we promised as the prototype, but we're going to be able to produce them on a reasonably automated, you know, medium scale production size. So, you know, maybe up to Rapid 1000 is fairly feasible without a lot of production engineering. And the idea is that by putting a data system and its energy source right in with the antenna and integrating it, there's the square kilometer antenna, you can actually uh, digitize the antenna completely. So we have high dynamic range, dual channel, uh, giga sample class digitization. We'll be storing about a gigabyte per second to solid state storage. Uh, there will be a fiber it's looking like coming off the thing. We'll do it in about 25 watts. Uh, we have a lot of prototypes. We've been building boxes. We've been taking test data. We've been building integrated hardware and breaking things. And there's still a lot more of that to be done before we uh, kind of spend our production money. Frequency coverage wise, we targeted 48 to 615 megahertz, which is, is the square kilometer array antenna design. Um, the extended coverage can go up to two gigahertz directly with a different antenna. You could attach subarrays to this underlying frame, which stacks for shipping. And then the, uh, you can actually go lower than this if you put an appropriate antenna on it. There's some trade-offs as you go to really low frequency. You might want a different analog chain in front of the digitizer. But um, nevertheless, we're, we're progressing very quickly on this. Now, we wanted to explore spatial diversity. You can pick it up and reconfigure it. You can go to a radio quiet zone. You can go next to a rate existing radar. Um, this is relevant in that a deployable facility is the answer to DAISY's inability to cover the entire globe. Okay, we can't afford to do what has happened with GPS, which has put out, you know, right now tens of tens of thousands, soon to be millions of sensors with a large constellation light, you know, lighting up paths. That's not going to happen on the budgets we have. And similarly, we're not going to be able to put out hundreds of thousands of radio sensors to get the sampling density high enough. But we might be able to afford a significant deployable facility that can be checked out much of the way seismographs can be checked out of UCAR or, or GPS systems, and the community can use them for concentrated experiments. Now, for fixed large-scale arrays, I proposed a geospace array arch architecture. This was a Quo Vadis talk I gave to IceCat 3D quite a while ago. And the architecture looks like separated transmit and receive arrays. You've seen this. Uh, narrow band transmitters at multiple sites. It doesn't do you much good to have a super broadband transmitter because you have poor matches and there's frequency licensing as a constraint. You have flexible transmitter duty cycles up to 100%. Uh, you have very large distributed digital broadband receiver arrays. They may not be all digital. They may use some of the time delay <coughs> subarraying that LOFAR, MWA, and LWA use. Um, Centrally dense aperiodic array layouts that optimize your ability to cover UV space. Uh, and cloud-based signal processing that allows you to scale the signal processing to uh, almost unimaginable levels. It'll be exaflops in the not too distant future. 
And then you get rid of everything else possible, so you can lower per element costs. And when you do this, uh, you can ask, well, can I, you know, this is medium power in, a, in the Arctic, it's an incoherent scatter radar. This is low power in a desert, you know, low cost per element in a desert. Um, We've been looking at how to build incoherent scatter radars this way. Uh, this is what we call Next ISR, which is a partnership with Diversified Technologies Incorporated to significantly lower the cost of incoherent scatter radar. We've modeled this system in detail. Uh, we have full architectural approaches, and we've begun hardware prototyping. Uh, if we get the second stage Air Force money, we'll begin doing demonstrators. Um, we have a simulator that came out of this for incoherent scatter radar called the Millstone MIT Incoherent Scatter Performance Simulator, MIPS, that allows us to uh, look at networks of incoherent scatter radars. It includes the physics. Uh, you can do bi-static, multi-static, MIMO, tilted arrays. It does parameter variance estimation. Um, and, you know, if you start building arrays of geospace radars, well, the incoherent scatter radar component is interesting to a lot of people. Um, if you build a lot of small systems, you can cover the F region and get distributed MIMO velocity estimates. Uh, this, this, you know, that's your 60 to 100 million dollars. There's 60 to 100 million dollars concentrated into three arrays per site. Um, and uh, these would be tilted and would face in different directions. That would get you kind of continental scale coverage. If you start pointing things at the horizon, you get what uh, Millstone Hill has, but you could do it in a modern digital sense. And there's the potential to build what's called a simultaneous transmit receive architecture uh, or star architecture that might allow you to have extraordinarily wide spatial coverage at high measurement speed. Um, so you can spend your money a lot of different ways. Um, our modeling has shown there's a huge difference between operational observational arrays where you distribute everything around the planet and very focused what I would call science grade instruments. So Yuha said there's only two discovery class instruments, and I'm sure you know Phil will disagree with that. Uh, many of us would disagree that Amiser hasn't discovered things. Uh, but nevertheless, the concept that bigger may be a lot better is a very important one. But also, it's important to not stovepipe ourselves into these very narrow frameworks of, of what's important scientifically. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Frank. Which brings up Phil Erickson. No, I just want to watch everything that happens on the board. Oh, I, I joke we have to build okay. on our side of the fences. For, we're we're going to build a wall. Yeah, that you guys, <laughs> we're going to build, build a wall. The wall. We'll yeah. look over the wall. We'll know when you're about to All right. And, 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 and we'll make you pay for it. We'll make our beer safe. <laughs> All right. Build the bots and hockey Okay, it's my lot in life to follow Frank, which means I have about two minutes. Um, but we'll see what I can do. Um, so those of you who don't know me, I'm the, I work at Millstone Hill with Frank and, and an extremely talented team of people. And I've been spending actually the last two or three years attached to even spending a lot of time in the Van Allen probes uh, science working groups. Which are, which are, if those of you who haven't looked at Van Allen probes results, you should, because there's an enormous amount of stuff coming out about the radiation belts. And one of the things we're learning is that it's not all simple at all. But for this, for this workshop, I think the very brief message I'm going to have is that I think there's some, de there's some discovery possibilities in the radiation belts and the plasmosphere, what we call the plasmosphere boundary layer, mainly because no one has really looked there, I think, in maybe the right way. Dave alluded to this a little bit earlier. So there's Van Allen, have to put him up. Um, and there's the nominal, very wrong inner and outer radiation belts picture. And the nice thing is that what I'm gonna show you is, of course, there's a couple of in situ platforms zipping around three times a day in and out of the radiation belts. So you get about, you get a, quite, a num quite amount of data and there's been a lot built up. And this has got everything you can think of. I mean, it's got you know multiple MeV, up to 100 MeV protons, to MeV electrons, all the way down to stuff that's literally at tens of EV and above. And there's even some thermal plasma in there. Um, all of this is magnetically connected to places in the ionosphere and plasmasphere that I spend my, my uh, career sort of looking at. And specifically, um, I think there's a lot of discovery space in the fact that this stuff is filled with coherent waves, as well as a lot of density structure having to do with the fact that this boundary layer, anywhere a hot, tenuous plasma overlaps a cold, dense plasma, there's tremendous amounts of energy exchange in there. And if you look at the wave data from those spacecraft I just showed you, 
there's chorus in here, there's, or whistlers, there's ULF waves, there's magnetosonic waves, there's electromagnetic ion cyclotron waves, there's incoherent plasmaspheric hiss. Um, roughly inside the plasmasphere, you have sort of a broadband incoherent like hiss. Outside of the plasmasphere, you tend to have these, these nice structured chorus uh, waves, which of course Stanford has been looking at from the ground using passive receivers for a long time. But one of the things we're figuring out is that all of this resonates with the, the, the MEV class plasma. So if you want to understand the radiation belts, you have to understand the cold black background plasma environment because it completely changes the cyclotron resonance equations. And your favorite linear and non-linear processes is in here. So this is a real basic space, but it's also an applied space because if you really want to know where that boundary is between the inside and the outside of the plasma sphere, it's going to make a huge difference in what the radiation belts do. I don't have time to talk about all of that, but you can go to Andy Van Pro's meeting and get knocked over by all of that including something like this, where in fact the inner edge of the outer belt appears to have a hard limit at L of 2.8 beyond which the particles don't go. And there's a whole controversial set of science in here. Starting to sense where these boundaries are and, and from the ground in a way that is not possible with a set of in situ equatorial pla uh, platforms is a really interesting thing. And radiation belts have some impact for people who are trying to fly a spacecraft or humans through there. Um, and they also have impacts in terms of understanding the particle precipitation down into the ground, creating rheometer signatures and other kinds of things that we in the atmosphere like to look at. And here's some, just a little bit of the wave environment there. So just to orient you, okay, this is going out of the plasma sphere. This is the upper hybrid line. This is the emphasis exp um, um, uh, instrument on Van Allen probes A. So this is the upper hybrid line. You can roughly take that as a measure of the electron, in situ electron density. Um, there you can see the plasma pause happening right here. This is half the, ion cyclo uh, the electron cyclotron frequency, and this is a log frequency scale down from here of tens of hertz all the way up to several hundred kilohertz. There's very large chorus that, it, that gets really, really bright, and this is a log scale, orders of magnitude brighter during, during uh, storm times. Below that, there are lower hybrid waves. There's enhanced magnetosonic waves here. There's the incoherent plasmaspheric hiss. All of this creates interesting coherent scatter properties that could be accessible, I think, from a radar that's at near somewhere near the equator, that's at a lower frequency to avoid the bi-length effects, and it's looking vertically out through this profile. You can do that. You can start associating some of these wave structures with boundaries, and we have a lot of in situ spacecraft data in the equatorial plane that can help you calibrate that. Um, this is just me pulling off a few electron density profiles in the plasma sphere boundary layer on one couple of storm days. This is the famous March 17th, 2015 storm. This is the one in 2013. This is as a function of L shell from 1.5 to 5 here. This is density on a log scale. See all of that structure? I can probably guarantee you that there's Bragg scatter in here at meter scale wavelengths. And Bragg scatter is a very coherent sort of scatter that I think we can access to study the turbulent structure of the plasma sphere boundary layer, not from the ground and mapping it up, but almost in, to compare with the in situ measurements. And that has profound structuring consequences for all of this cold plasma, which there's sort of a water cycle of cold plasma. It's coming off the edge of the plasma sphere. It's going out. It's affecting reconnection rates. It's affecting the transport of cold O plus material back into the tail and into the ring current, and on and on. So what I did was, the very last thing I'm going to put up, and then we can talk about this later, Frank mentioned this MIPS simulator that we have around. So what I did was I took Dave Heisel's sort of nominal uh, radar uh, um, set points for a very nominal solar radar. I constructed this representative equatorial profile, basically really from stapling IRI together with actual Van Allen probes data during um, a reasonably a moderately disturbed interval. This is L of 2, this is L of 3. So the plasma sphere boundary is maybe a little bit below L of 3. And this is my extremely back of the envelope uh, temperature profile, assuming it's going to get to somewhere about 1 eV, about uh, L of 3. We actually have some, some evidence that that might be not that far off. This is the VHF radar performance. Now, the first thing I want, this is just for incoherent scatter. So this is to do the profiles that Dave was talking about that were done, for example, from Hikamarka back in the 1960s. This is the signal to noise ratio in a log scale, OK? This is L of 2 and L of 3. The profiles that Don Farley showed that were done from Hikamarka in the 1960s were getting out into about here. 
This is our model's estimates, and this is a conservative estimate. I think the result is actually somewhat better of how long it takes you to get to something, in this case, about 30 or 40 percent uncertainty in the electron density just from incoherent scatter. The purple line is 10 minutes, this is one hour, and this is four hours. So somewhere around in here, you can probably sense the thermal uh, electron density profile out that far. I think Dave and Marco can test it, and I think they are. But so you then say, well, but what about beyond that? And my last conclusion is that if there are coherent irregularities beyond that point, and I just showed you a wave plot full of them, this is the radar cross-section needed above that incoherent scatter level to sort of get you to a signal-to-noise ratio of 0 dB, so 1, 0.1, and 0.01. Pick your flavor of detection. And I think that these numbers are not that far off of things that, for example, we see from Farley-Bunum and turbulence in the ionosphere, where you can get stuff that's up, six, eight, so up 60, 80 dB over incoherent scatter. I think this is detectable. And I think that I've suggested to Dave uh, to go look for this at Hikamarka, and I think that's underway. If this is possible, this is kind of a discovery space, and it has not only basic physics implications, but it also has a remote sensing implication where you can start from the ground looking at these boundaries in a way that is really hard to do from an orbiting spacecraft that spends some time through that boundary and mostly kind of racing through it. So I'm going to leave it there, and we can talk a little bit about that later. Oh, she. You're wondering how you got into this group. Well, no, this one. That's my. That's oh, this one. Oh, got it. Yeah. Oh, don't give that. That would be no good. And there. That's right. Great. Thanks a lot, Toshi. So our next speaker is Toshi Nishimura. Oh. All right, thank you. So uh, when Lee was uh, originally asked to give uh, this uh, topic of presentation, but she couldn't, couldn't come to this meeting, but she made all the slides, so let me present on her behalf. So um, Phil a little bit mentioned about magnetospheric waves. Um, so there are all kinds of waves going on in the magnetosphere, including things shown here. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about details of these waves, but uh, let me just say that these waves are all important uh, for pitch angle scattering particles dumping energy into the ionosphere, upper, an upper atmosphere. So we need to understand how these waves are distributing all over the magnetosphere and how, when and where those waves are going to intensify and decay. So in order to understand um, how the ring current radiation belt plasma sheet particles are interacting and coupling to the ionosphere. So, but that's a very difficult question with just a few satellite measurements near the equator. We only have a few sample points, but waves are pretty much everywhere, and different modes of waves are distributed in different locations. So that's where low altitude satellites and ionosphere should play a role. So that's why we want to talk to the ionosphere community particularly. So how that works is illustrated in here. So, um, for example, chorus waves are generated near the equator. Those are interacting with trap, uh, high energy particles. Pitch angle scattering happens, and those are precipitating down into the upper atmosphere. So those can be measured by low altitude satellites or, or, or radar measurements from the ground. Um, so those are use, useful a possible remote sensing method. And uh, precipitation by itself is important uh, for ionospheric um, dynamics because those are going to ionize uh, neutral particles and also those are going to heat the upper atmosphere. So we need to understand how much energy is really coming into the upper atmosphere. But to do that in a global sense, that's a pretty difficult question. So let me show you one example of how this is working. So this is an example of the Van Allen probes coming nearby the ISCAT radar field of view. So in this case, the Van Allen probes measured en enhanced uh, wave activity, right, right, like in this case. And the ISCAT uh, data, this is the density as a function of altitude and time. So once the wave intensified, this strong precipitation came deep into the upper atmosphere, down, down to like 70 kilometers altitude or so. So th those are really high energy particles heating the upper atmosphere, probably by 300 keV of particles or so. So we need to understand um, when and where such high energy particles are really coming in order to understand the ionosphere, atmosphere dynamics. So, but with ra uh, one single radar, what we can do is really in limited scale size. So what WEN did is that, so by taking the five uh, NOAA satellite, NOAA pole satellite, so which provides uh, far better local time and latitudinal coverage, 
and uh, deduce the wave amplitude from precipitation data. Uh, so this is a particular storm event. And the second panel showed the Van Allen probe in situ measurement of plasma wave intensity along the, uh, along the satellite tracks. So yes, we can see wave enhancement associated with geomagnetic storms. But this has huge limitation. One, the, the time cadence is pretty low. So every 10 hours or so, we get one point. So there are huge gaps around. And also, this can only be done along the satellite track, so we don't have measurements at our local, at, at local times. So by using low altitude satellites, so we can fill the gaps. So, the, so these are uh, deduced wave amplitude from precipitation data from NOAA. So we nicely see the continuous coverage of wave activity along the wide l shell range uh, continuous over time. So nice wave enhancement, pretty much consistent with in situ wave intensity. So this technique is working pretty well. And not only that, we, by using uh, measurements at other local times, so we can get pretty much the whole MLT coverage of uh, wave intensification. So the remote sensing from low altitude is pretty powerful for deducing what's happening uh, in the magnetosphere. So uh, to the ionosphere community, so what uh, we want to say is that so now we have low altitude satellites and also radars, not only just incoherent scatter radars, but coherent scatter radars are also important for deducing plasma waves for like SAPS flows. And for realmeters, all sky cameras, these can give all different types of properties of precipitation and plasma properties. So now, so these are sometimes coordinated, but in many cases not coordinated well. So what we uh, really want to do in order to do this in a predictable way, what, in a way that we can really plug into um, the so geospace monitoring framework, so what we want is looks something like this. So currently, so there are nice instruments, uh, for example, in um, North America, but these are somewhat scattered in different areas. So, but what we want is the, uh, the co uh, coordination of these instruments. Green here is, by the way, the radars, not only just ISR, but coherent radars like, um, you know, like what Dave and um, Bill has. And so those should be coordinated with all sky cameras and realmeters and so on to get a wide range of spectral information. And that's what Eric Donvan's Skynet is proposing, and I'm fully uh, supporting with that. So with those things, so it's not necessary in this kind of wide scale, it really depends on the uh, budget available. But in the forecast area, we should bring all necessary instruments together to get the co comprehensive understanding of the uh, MIT coupling processes. So in the last slide, so if we have such coordinations, so we can do interesting science. So from space, we can get really high resolution institute measurements like binary and probes. But uh, with ground, we can see um, nice coupling processes that one spacecraft can't do. So for example, how the particle injection from a tail is going to interrupt with the wave intensification. Waves are going to make huge intensification like in the ice cut example you saw earlier. So, so we need to have two dimensional at least capability to see the, how dynamically the magnetosphere is evolving. And also with such measurements, uh, we should be able to specify how quantitatively each magnetospheric wave modes are changing and how the precipitation is changing and um, dumping energy into the ionosphere. And yeah, so that's the thing in the, in the third bullet. So in conclusion, so now the community has a lot, a lot of nice assets around. So we need to uh, coordinate these and also increase the number of instruments to cover as much space as possible so to get the comprehensive understanding of parameters uh, in the MIT coupling system. And that's it. So then the last speaker of the session is Bill Bristow. And the Geophysical Institute. What indeed? <laughs> Do you want to start enumerating? Yeah. <laughs> Let's keep the list running. There should be a question are you asking, mark. Are you asking us or? <laughs> What's wrong, guys? Come on. There's no question mark at the end of that. Um, there should be. <laughs> Actually, it's not. I'm going to tell you See, what I think is wrong. Right. Okay. Um, th this talk is uh, a little different from the preceding talks in that uh, I think we should do one thing but do it really well. Um, not only one thing, but I'll let other folks do other things. Um, 
Superdarn is, um, I'll start with what's right, sorry guys. Um, Superdarn is probably one of the most widely used data sets in, um, in our area in, in uh, space physics, not so much solar. Um, and because it does, it does this, it produce maps, produces maps of uh, the plasma flows in the upper atmosphere over large regions. Um, it's not quite global scale, but it's pretty much the entire uh, rural regions from mid-latitudes mid up to the center of the polar cap. Does it in both hemispheres? Does it continuously, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with um, more or less, you know, at times great coverage, sometimes not such great coverage. And, and this, this is, this is its reason for being is producing these maps, uh, and it's a parameter that is absolutely necessary for a lot of people's work. Uh, so it. If you're going to do modeling of uh, atmospheric densities, upper atmospheric densities, you need to know what electric fields are heating up the atmosphere. Uh, if you want to know uh, where gradients are going to form in the uh, ionospheric densities, you need to know where the flows that are transporting plasma around, those kinds of things. So it, it's very useful in, for a lot of purposes. <coughs> but, so there's a lot of things wrong. Um, and, and this is just a short list. I'm sure that Eric and Phil could keep going on this. But so, so um, typically our spatial resolution is on the order of about 100 kilometers for convection, um, which is actually compared to what models can do for global scale work, not bad. I mean, it's, it is uh, good enough for our current day um, modeling. Uh, and our typical time resolution is on the order of a, a minute. So that's, that's a long time, actually. Um, scatter is often not received where you want it. Uh, the index of refraction in the plasma causes an underestimate of the velocity that we measure, so we have to know the index of refraction. And because it's, it's relying on refraction to get propagation over long distances, the position where we're actually making a measurement is somewhat uncertain. Um, and, and to illustrate why this is important, so this, this is uh, a figure from some work I did uh, in last year where you're taking over time, um, looking at the aurora in the, in the false color here uh, from uh, what, 68 degrees magnetic up to 74. And you see um, all these structures in the aurora. And if you take our, our global scale convection patterns with the roughly um, one uh, or 100 kilometers resolution and about a minute, um, you actually don't see a heck of a lot of correspondence between what's happening in the flows and what's happening in the aurora. So the, um, the work that, that for the, this paper was based on is to look at taking our existing data and you know, figuring out ways that we can use a, you know, better analysis to, to uh, get localized estimates of the flow, improve resolution and improve time resolution. And, and actually, if you, if you base your estimates of what's happening in the flows by just local measurements, not looking at global scales, you actually do start to see correspondence between what's happening in the aurora and what's happening in the, uh, in the plasma flow. Uh, th this happened to be uh, mapping of what we call polar, or, uh, PBIs, polar cap boundary intensifications, probably plasma flows in the tail uh, coming in uh, and you know, into the inner magnetosphere. And you see this where there's, you know, Tremendous, you have flow in one direction before the, this PBI and flow in the opposite direction. Actually, watching this in a movie is pretty dramatic. You see just the flows tracking along with the, with the arcs um, just uh, quite, quite consistently. Um, but if you actually go to the raw data that went into producing that, um, that we actually have a much finer resolution than what we have that we can map in the, in the convection in both time and, um, and in, in space. So this is looking at a single direction with nine kilometers range resolution and three second time resolution. And, and you see just a tremendous amount of structure in, and in both time and space. This is a reversal of uh, going from, you know, say 800 meters per second in one direction to 800 meters per second in the opposite direction in seconds, you know, just, just within the three seconds. So, you, you know, constantly things are happening in the ionosphere at really small scales, um, really high or, or you know, small spatial and temporal scales. And, and if you are gonna do something like modeling, you know, heating in the atmosphere, you really need to know the correspondence between those fields and the, and the, the, the conductivity at those scales. You, know, you can't do a, an average over a you know, 50 kilometer grid of the velocity and the, uh, and the luminosity. 
Here's another example. So, so this is um, looking at a standard resolution from SuperDAR, and this is 45 kilometers, one minute. That's our normal sampling. If you go to looking in the in uh, say six kilometers in one second, it's just tremendously different in what you see in the uh, in the ionosphere. Um, all of this structuring is completely missed in the uh, in the standard data product. This this is just another example. So now this is just zooming in on this section where we're just looking at scattered power, and you zoom in and look at the flows, and you know you see these very narrow channels, uh, very high velocities. You know, tremendous gradients in the in the plasma flows over very small distances and over short short times. Um, and this is just another example I thought was you know great. Just the the amount of variability within short amounts of time continually there. So what I think is we should we definitely need to to uh, if we're going to move on with uh, being able to model things is is think about next generation measurements. Um, and I think that we can actually do something that has spatial resolution on the order of a few kilometer, not even tens of kilometers. And we can actually get that entire convection map in a second instead of once a minute. Um, and it could be done, I think, for a modest amount of money. Uh, we would need denser arrays of radars, um, continuous multi-frequency operation. And by doing that, we can extend the areas of coverage uh, we can correct for this index of refraction. Uh, we can improve our coordinate registration. We even start to measure some other parameters. You could actually do like a, a bottom side density profile over fairly large regions. And, and what it's going to take is doing you know, some optimized antenna arrays and then implementation of aperture synthesis or you know, imaging radars. So th this might fit in nicely with the stuff that Frank's talking about. I probably wouldn't go you know, with measuring as many parameters as Frank would like to measure. I don't need to, to do, you know, transmitting frequencies up in the hundreds of megahertz. I need HF so I can do coherent scatter, not as much power. And when, when I told uh, Dave that this was what I was going to talk about at the meeting, he started throwing uh, acronyms to me. So um, actually the next slide. So what I think we should do is we'd have something like radars located every 10 degrees in latitude and longitude starting at about 50 degrees magnetic. Something like 25 sites would cover all of North America, and I think I could do a pretty decent job for about a million dollars per site. And there's my acronym. <laughs> that was Dave's, actually. Nice. So, that's it. All right, thanks. So, so stay where you are. So I'm going to ask our speakers to come back and uh, populate our calendar. <laughs> Just about every, uh, enough room for everyone at the table. What are you pointing at? The projector. Oh. So we're, not, so we're not blinded. I like it this way. Hot light treatment. There. All right. So here we are again. Uh, so uh, do we have um, some questions for our speakers? Mm-hmm. No more. Oh. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, radar measurement of the sun is very interesting. And what is a scatterer, a scattering mechanism? It is the uh, uh, total reflection from the dense plasma, or and also what happens when you want to have a scatterer from a CME? Well, it's, it's total reflection. Um, total reflection at the sun surface. Yeah. And the in case of a she okay. I believe I'm trying to answer this, but I think one. I think the way I understand it from reading one of Bill's review articles. So, if you just bounce a wave off of the corona, um, the the two circular polarizations uh, uh, penetrate to different depths before they reflect out, and so the information you get in the delay of the two polarizations is telling you about the density profile. If a CME is coming out, and again, in a simplistic 
model where it's just like this big, simple density perturbation, which it isn't. Um, then the two circular polarizations actually reflect off of the same height, but what but they are delayed now because of the Faraday, because of the magnetic field, because of the Faraday rotation. So when you measure, when you're actually getting an echo from a CME, you'll be getting the delay between the two circular polarizations is different, and it's telling you about the magnetic field. That's my, that's everything I know. <laughs> well, it's essentially a light song for the song, but, but and there, there's a, there's ray bending, there's uh, magnetonic propagation, there's, there's um, Oh, next mode splitting, so it, it, it's going to be complicated to analyze. Much more than an, complicated than an, an anagram. So, also some of the anomalously high cross sections that were measured, if you believe that measurements uh, sparked a flurry of uh, literature uh, speculating about uh, coherent scatter uh, from wave modes that are present, particularly in, in CMEs, but also in the sun. So, whether that has to be backtracked uh, as we sort of zero in on a better estimate of the, of the scattering cross-section or not, I don't know. And just, just to introduce a little little controversy, just so that people may know, that, you know, <clears throat> Bill Coles has been, he's been sort of the, the one who's been skeptical about some of this stuff, and I think, you know, it's the fact that Don is confident in some of these earlier results, you know, r means a lot to me. But just so you know, what, what Bill felt was going on with some of the if if they weren't seeing echoes, it's the it's the noise storm leaking into the detection and mimicking uh, echoes. And he said he saw things like that at Hickamarca. In other words, they would be observing and looking for echoes, and they would see things, you know, uh, artifacts that were clearly that were that he was able to figure out were because of the noise storm, not because of a of a radar echo. But he could have he could have seen why. Earlier, people might have interpreted them differently. So any, anyway, no, no, you can cut me down. <laughs> no, no, no. Just a comment, though, that the that the if it's induced by a noise storm, then the actual peak, uh, the range of the peak echo would tend to fluctuate considerably. Uh, and in fact, the El Campo peak echo delay, which comes in at something like 1.2, 1.3 solar radii, is is pretty consistent on uh, in general throughout the uh, the observations. And so that's what sort of convinces you that uh, that they're probably real. Mm. Oh, well, uh, two comments re regarding these El Campo results. When Willie Coles did the experiment at Jicamarca, what we found is that according to the Jicamarca results, what El Campo could have seen were these noise-induced uh, false echoes, range alias or Doppler alias into what El Campo was able to resolve at the time. And that's, uh, and some of the event, uh, effects that we found are the, for example, we found false echoes in the back of the sun. So in the wrong direction of what we were expecting. And the sigma values, we were able to get two sigma type of uh, e e things that could have been echoes. And so, it, this is where Bill Coles was uh, very, very skeptical and from, from, from the results. But coming to your presentation, and you, said it, and you, you did experiments in 1960, 66. At the time, Farley and Bowles were doing solar experiments at, uh, at Hikamarca. We, with Dave and Bill Coles, we have tried to get the uh, information from them, but they don't have anything written. Did you guys? Uh, communicate at the time? Do you exchange results? Do you have an idea of a... No, definitely not. Um, uh, no, no communication. Uh, I was totally unaware that they were using a marker for that purpose, and they were probably totally unaware that we were using Arecibo for that purpose. No internet at the time. No, so there was no, you got <laughs> no internet, no, uh, <laughs> no telephones hardly. From Arecibo, there was literally no telephones. Uh, so, uh, so. I mean, the real problem here is the paper trail is very thin. The El Campo results look great. There aren't that many published. You know, there aren't no results published. You know, we don't have, you know, a huge spread of good, bad, and indifferent results. We have what were presumably the, the best results in a few of them. And, uh, and that's it's really a problem. I yeah, mean, I was going to comment on that, that there must be a huge amount of other data that was not published from El Campo. And I don't know whether that still exists or uh, whether it's hidden in some files 
somewhere at MIT, uh, et cetera. But it is, would be very much worthwhile uh, seeing if we could find w out. Was science just the Wild West, you know, in the 60s? Is, I mean... <laughs> just the <eggs>. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, in a sense, yes. There was no way, no way to archive things except in hard copy. Mm. Uh, seriously, at that, uh, in 1961 uh, especially. But your results look terrific and the parish results look terrific. And then scaling up, El Campo really should have worked. Yes. And, um, no and so it's, a, it's a little bit mysterious. Somewhere in the sort of 3, 2, 3 to 5 dB better sensitivity than Arecibo. They were linearly polarized, and therefore, in a sense, the, from their perspective, the returned echo was depolarized because mm. of these uh, propagation you know, effects of the extraordinary, extraordinary, and ordinary rays. And so, um, and so they were probably down a factor of two in, uh, in their reception, even though half the array was actually dual right. polarized. But there's no information in the papers, as far as I can see, that discusses the orthogonal uh, polarization results. Mm. Oh, I think Anthea wants to jump in on that. Oh, sorry, Anthea. Um, and then... Well, just quickly, who uh, at MIT was doing in charge? Was that at Lincoln Laboratory? Was it Pettengill? No, 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 it was Jesse James. Jesse James, was he at Lincoln Laboratory? So, okay, so they have archives back there that we can ask them to look for it. I, I know that uh, people at Lincoln have brought up building a solar radar. They have archives. Uh, just a, a comment from Bill Coles. He's uh, watching us from, from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> He, he said that this data uh, has, is, exists and uh, is, uh, has been analyzed by Tony Van Eiken. So maybe we can ask Tony Van Eiken. He'll be here tomorrow. So um, are you on this topic or are you wanting to change topic? On the topic of the session. Uh, but, but I mean this, 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 no, this, this theme. This, no. Go ahead and then we'll go to Larry. Oh, sure. Sure, please. Um, just a comment, at least. Uh, I think, um, <clears throat> the mayor, you said that they, you're talking about resolutions about three arc minutes on the uh, on the sun, that that's going to Im imply uh, very large high uh, high powers to so get that uh, that sort of resolution. If you think about it, the if you believe the El Campo results. They effectively have power in something like 25 or 30 pixels, um, and so if you're going to break it up, uh, the disk disk up into three arc minute uh, areas, uh, there's a lot of those three arc minute areas in say uh, uh, one degree, you know, take going out one and a half degrees uh, disk say, and so you would need a lot of power to uh, to compensate for that. Mm -hmm. So I was I was going to say that. Um, Changing the topic slightly, that Bill Bill Bristow's presentation. I mean, the the continent scale convection map with that kind of fidelity, with you know second scale, kilometer scale, temporal and spatial resolution. I would say would probably set the gem and cedar community on fire. I mean, I think that would be really, really tremendous. Um, you and I have a difference of opinion, I think, on, on the extent. Like, I, I, would, I would focus on doing a better job over a somewhat smaller region, but, you know, we can have that argument, you know, over years, right? And the other thing is I would, I would also say that, you know, I, I mean, I heard what you said about, you know, you want to do this and do this well, but I would say that in to take our field to the next level, particularly the geospace community, to take us to the next level, I don't think we can afford to bring that 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 to what we, I think we can't afford to do convection well for five years and then do precipitation well for the next five years. I think we have to decide to do a number of things simultaneously well now. And I think that's actually really important. But I was really, I mean, I think it's fantastic what you showed. And again, I regret not sending you the camera data. Bill, I, I just had a question. To what degree do the existing stations have to be uh, upgraded? I mean, you're doing pretty well with what you showed. Right, so that, that's Kodiak. Can you can do the link, please, for the webcast. OK, so that, that, that was Kodiak. Kodiak is different from all the rest. Kodiak can only do that in one direction. So oh, we, we will, gotcha. yeah, so you do have to do some other things. Not tremendously different things, but. but not the old radars. Not the old radars, no. Uh, let's see, Larry lots of questions. Yes, yeah, so I agree a lot with what, with what Eric was saying, and then I was interested in 
Bill's talk and Frank's talk, right? But you both only got halfway there in terms of what I'm interested in. Okay, you know, Bill, with, with your talk, you've got the spatial and temporal coverage that we really need, but, but you didn't mention about that, you know, how often you're actually gonna get echoes for that kind of thing. And then Frank's talk, you talked about, I guess it's ISR type type radar, so you're gonna get the coverage, but, and you get reasonable spatial, res, you know, coverage options, but I didn't hear anything about the uh, the spatial and temporal resolution to be able to get that way. So I got questions for both of you in that regard. Then go on and get, you know, options. Sure. Well, I, I can start with addressing the, the amount of scatter. Yeah, you're right. We'll never, we're never going to get all, you know, everywhere all the time. There's, there are things that I mentioned in there that will improve the amount and, and also the certainty about where it is and, you know, other issues there. Denser array, multi-frequency operation, uh, continuous multi-frequency operation helps with both of those, uh, both those issues. Now, as far as, you know, whether it's ISR or coherent scatter, you save a lot of money if all you have to do is coherent scatter. So, an awful lot. So um, we, I, our model lets us evaluate a lot of different radar sizes, and we kind of we kind of focused on evaluating profilers, uh, what we call a baseline system, which is a miser like, and then we've looked at a couple large, you know, a large thing which can either be one one array face or multiple array faces in one place, or it can look more like the Mars concept I showed, which I developed with Lincoln Laboratory in about 2006, where you're you're putting everything so that you can actually see in a geometry where you can see the horizon. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of trade-off in performance with these radars but in, in the, you know, the total power aperture. And you can either push the power up and have the minimum size aperture. And that works really well for profilers. Um, and then, then you know, the profiler is seeing the F region peak, and if it's doing MIMO, it's getting very fast velocity measurements, but it's not, it takes a long time to see lower in altitude or higher in altitude. The baseline system was modeled on a miser performance uh, over wider spatial areas. And so those are very similar to our existing radars. Um, what's very noticeable is as you push the SNR of the radar up by making it larger in power aperture, you you start to be able to use that Air, that SNR like Arecibo does, or like IceCat 3D will be able to, to make multiple simultaneous measurements either spatially or using frequency diversi diversity or to increase measurement speed. So there you start to get radars that make measurements in seconds or sub-second type time scales. And so your coverage in terms of number of directions you could scan, say, becomes incredible because you're, you're able to, you know, tick, 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 in the time where a miser might tick, 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 you know, even though you're interleaving pulse to pulse. So there's a lot of architectural trade-offs in how much you want to cover. Um, another trade-off is that if you build a very large aperture, it costs you more up front but its operating costs can be a lot lower because you can draw, you can have a megawatt radar that has very high measurement speed. Um, the simultaneous transmit and receive, of course, lets you do all the receive applications all the time, which makes it very useful for all these secondary transmitters, as well as radio astronomy, solar monitoring. It starts to look like phaser if you put the right outliers out. So there's a, there's a lot of architectural trades, and you know one of the things I came to the conclusion pretty quickly was, monitoring networks, i.e. what NOAA or the Air Force want, look, and they're providing very regular space weather inputs, look a whole lot different than what I would, in UHA might term discovery class scientific instruments. And we, as a community, talking about, you know, of order of 100 or a few hundred million dollars, aren't quite in the ballpark to get everything we want. Words, if you really, you know, you could imagine putting three big radars like Mars up at mid-latitudes, and then doing that at the equator, and then doing that at the conjugate region, and then you know maybe IceCat could do IceCat 3D and a conjugate IceCat 3D, and we'd have an incredible ability to monitor geospace. But that starts to look you know like a billion-dollar project. It doesn't start to look like a few hundred million-dollar project. And so, you know, it, there's a reality here. And, you know, for example, the super darn costs. Well, you know, Eric was talking about maybe a smaller region. Well, maybe deployable. <laughs> you know, maybe you can move it to different areas. Um, anyway, thank you. So I guess I would, I would follow up that, that you, know, you know, Bill, since your costs are, are low, it seems like maybe if you in, in, increase the number of radars, maybe you could increase the amount of, you know, coverage and get the kind of stuff you want. Where, where Frank, you know, 
it sounded like maybe you can't quite get the, the time resolution and spatial resolution all together that, that Bill was talking about, but could you get something like, you know, three to five seconds and, you know, a few kilometers rather than one kilometer, five, ten kilometers, can, something like that? You can trade it off. So if you want, if you put all, you know, say you put all your, your eggs in one basket and built kind of North America's IceCat 3D, but broadband and maybe a little more advanced in certain ways and, you know, in a different geophysical region, then you're going to get that sub-second coverage and you're going to be able to do this, this wide spatial field of view potentially, either with multiple systems or with one central system. Um, you know, I, I think that once you collapse down, you know, you can make it smaller, you can do a series of things that are sized like a miser. We might be able to do it cheaper, but maybe not, we'll see. And uh, then you've got similar time cadences to the existing radar systems. So that's a choice. That's that's you know something as a community, I think, we have to discuss what is better for our science, what's better for our discoveries that we might make. How much is rapid? Rapid, um, work, it, it's very dependent on volume, OK? There is a, a very fast gradient as you go from 100 to 1,000 units. We're talking about making less than 100. Um, in quantity, 1,000, we're at roughly $5,000 per element with the power. Now, you can put a subarray on top of that instead of a single antenna, which is, of course, what we intend to do for in-core and scatter radar reception. So then you're amortizing at about 16 to 1, perhaps, if you do something similar to LWA or MWA or LOFAR. Um, and then, you know, lower quantities, it goes up pretty rapidly. So we're going to be a little higher than that. But. It's amazing that our community is as small as it is, and we haven't had this kind of discussion before. We haven't bought lots and lots of yeah. If you buy 100,000, it's a whole lot cheaper. I mean, if, if this, is, this is, no, I mean, no, no really. This, if, this, is, this is an argument for doing the really big radar, because the unit cost of the elements drops incredibly. I mean, you'd be, you'd be down at a few, you know. Anyway, I, I, that's for future study. What? That's true of everything, though. Yes. Um, well, and, and, and that's something that, you know, one, one of the reasons, when I was starting to look at DAISY, one of the ideas that was driving me was a miser's experience, where they were too small to get, in terms of production volume, to get really good prices. And in fact, at first, I know Craig remembers this, the companies wouldn't even talk to him because it was the 2000 internet boom and nobody wanted a small job. And, and, and they're perfectly happy to make 100,000 or a million of something. And if you're talking about a few thousand, it's like, you know, why would we bother? And so. If we built instruments that could scale to those sizes, well, they need to be inexpensive, probably. And, and you know, there's a limit to that, especially for high power transmitters. The receive side, we can really scale pretty well, especially as you start to be able to make chips. But the transmit side, that power amplifier fed in there drives the cost. And, you know, the, the, the architectures where you do low power per element very large numbers of elements, well, you immediately have 100,000 elements. So you, now you're in that, that range, but it's not, you're paying up front for that capability and ultimately a lower operating cost. So the life cycle cost actually might be very similar, but the upfront bill is a lot higher. Um, yeah, just a comment and a question. Uh, the, the comment was, you know, I, I found this session really interesting because of the convergence of sort of the ISR uh, coherent radar and the aperture synthesis applications, all sort of converging below FM band. And, uh, you know, may, maybe all the phaser science could be addressed by uh, some kind of facility that, that jointly did this diverse menu of science. But the question was looping back to the um, solar radar application. I, I have no doubt, actually, that, you know, physics is physics. If you have a plasma ball out there, it will reflect, right? Um, but the question is, I mean, and, and what was not known during the Jesse James era, we didn't know about many of the macro structures in the corona. We didn't know about CMEs. We didn't know about what sort of scattering phenomena could occur. So I think it's, it's certainly a problem that's ripe to revisit. And I'm, you know, Don uh, sort of suggested some things that were necessary for Arecibo to go back uh, to, to have another, another look at this. And I, what I just want to put out there is what kind of investment needs to be made by the community near term to sort of put this to bed so we can move forward with it. Because it's a tremendously exciting application if it pans out and is understood. So just, just quickly, I mean, the first thing that we can do is, is revisit Hikamarka. And a lot has changed at Hikamarka since uh, Bill Coles was there. So we're looking forward to working with our, our partners and doing that for basically the cost of some repairs. 
I think Bill Coles had a proposal in 2001 to uh, put a 26 megahertz, use the heater for a solar radar, and that was six million dollars, right? Or he wanted to use a the upper frequency of a plant heater facility at that time, using a broadcast transmitter that had wide, uh, wide had, could go up to uh, 26 megahertz, and so he was making use of a plan that was already in uh, in in pro so pro are we talking progress. About investments of 10,000, 100,000 million before sort of jumping into. Oh, if you wanted to put, I'm, you're talking about something like a 300 kilowatt transmitter or something like that on Arecibo, and I think that'd be the minimum sort of level you'd want to go to. Uh, you're talking about, I'm not sure, but you're probably talking about by the time you implemented a new feed and all those things, and my guess is you're talking probably at least a couple of million. Mm -hmm. So maybe a few hundred thousand. But you have to add the the receiver part, right? The somehow LWA or low far. So that's a geometry that you have to check. Huh? Sort of okay. Oh, you, you just want to go after the normal, quiet solar echo. Yes. So oh, I know I have a comment. Sorry, it uh, was related to to the uh, coherent and, inco and incoherent uh, radars. Uh, I, 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 I see that the globe, the large coverage is important. But when I see Bill Bristol map, remind me the problem that I'm facing in the MLT dynamics is that there is a huge gap in Russia. And how important it is to cover that part for the type of research that the, the CDAR gem community is, is pursuing? So that depends on what you're pursuing, I guess. Eric says, let's go over a narrower region than just cover central Canada. Um, there are certainly people who would like to see global convection patterns covering Russia. Yeah. It sure just really depends on your application. Yeah, certainly if you're doing global like thermosphere, you know, winds, you need to have as large a region of coverage as possible. Could, could I jump in for one second? Because I mean, you know, I, I would say I wanted to 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 maybe push back a little bit on one comment that you made, Bill, which was. You know, it won't work all the time. You know, you know, you won't get scattered from everywhere. And, and one of the things that, that you know, the criticism that you could bring towards something like what we're talking about with this sort of Daisy Skynet, whatever kind of you know, super shucks, um, you know, thing, um, mega shucks. You know, the criticism you could bring to that, is, I, I think, would bring to that is, if you don't get complete images of what you're going after, it will look a bit like more of the same. And I try, and I was thinking about this, thinking at your super darn map, and where you have a, a bit of scatter here, and 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 I was tr gonna ask the solar guys, like if you were looking at images of the solar disk, but you were only getting images from maybe 1% of the disk, and not only that, those spots were moving around all the time, and that's all you ever had. I mean, that's kind of the situation we're in. Right, where we're not, we're not really imaging the upper atmosphere. We're not really imaging these processes. And so I would say the challenge for us moving forward is going to be to make images, not optical images, but images of these processes simultaneously in multiple parameters and make them work over those regions. And that, that's not gonna be cheap. So th there are physical reasons why you won't get scatter everywhere all the time. They have nothing to do with the system. No matter what system you build, if you're going for coherent scatter, you're not gonna have something there all the time. You have, you know, the, the, uh, if you have a strong E region, you can lose the F region regularities. If you have a strong D region, you can lose the propagation path. So if you, if you don't go to incoherent scatter, if you're gonna go with coherent scatter, there are gonna be times in where you're just not gonna get the coverage. So it's just a matter of money. But that's, I, think, I think that's actually my, my point. My point is, we could take an uncompromising view towards what we would not accept. Sure. And say what's you know, and you're saying it's just a matter of money, but that's that that maybe maybe that's. Not, that's yeah, but th it is also it's a it's a step function in money. You can do pretty darn well for about twenty-five million. Pretty darn. Pretty darn. Pretty darn. Okay, that's the next name. <laughs> <laughs> but but if if you want. <laughs> if you want the kind of coverage and the kind of spatial and temporal resolution with ISR, I don't, I don't believe, Frank, that you can do it for, uh, you know, 100 million. I'm, I think you're, you're going to get up to that hundreds of million of, of dollars to get it, and, you know, a billion. An operational costs that are astronomical. 
That remains to be seen. Okay, I'm going to jump in because I know we are all waiting to take Scott up on his offer. We are past the in time already. So you're going to hate me for this, but we can save it for tomorrow. I, I just felt the last, um, the first few sessions we held the solar community, our solar heliospheric people up on the panels at a very high standard of continuously asking, so what is the science? What is it you can get us? If you do this measurement, are we getting the uh, magnetic, the IMF field? Are we getting an uh, eruption? Are we going to be able to forecast this? So Bill and all the rest of you, Eric, what is it that this higher spatial and temporal resolution, what is it it will give us? What is the exciting science question? I don't want this complicated picture of, oh, it's the everything. <laughs> I want something, as we talked about, very early on that we can sell and that will be appealing to a much broader audience. How are you going to, besides the solar radar, how are you going to convince the solar people here in the audience that, yes, this is also geospace science they could get excited about? So I mean I, I'm not sure that we would be able to convince the solar guys um, that you know you know but but you know what I, what I, what I would what I would what what I, what I would say what I would say what I would say is that there's actually a long line of questions that have been open on the geospace side for 50 years. What causes an auroral arc? What causes a substorm onset? What is the effect of relativistic energy, energetic um, um, particle precipitation on the upper atmosphere? And that the kind of multi-scale, mesoscale, multi-parameter view that Toshi talked about, that I'll talk about tomorrow, that if we don't do that, we will never answer those questions, period, right? Because we have this global view that isn't good enough Right? And we have the small scale view that isn't extensive enough. And we have missed that gap for 50 years. Right? And so we just look at the arc and we go, we don't know what the convection patterns are around the arc because we can't resolve things in one or two kilometer spatial resolution with the kind of temporal resolution we need to, we need to look at. You look at Larry Lyons, PhD student, uh, Bea Gallardo, and she's looking at the structuring of the flows with the Themis mode super darn data around the beating onset arc. But it's 1D, one parameter, and it's not enough. And we can't resolve the physics of these instabilities with the, with the in-situ data, with the global data, with the single station data, or with the white light data. We can't do it. And so there's, I would say there's 10 questions that are foundational in our field that we will simply never close if we don't wake up and do a fundamentally different approach to the multi-scale problem. That's my pitch. That's my talk for tomorrow, so I'm done. Go ahead. So I, I think my answer to your question is measure the parameters they actually care about. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I, they've got a set of radio measurements that can be made with ground-based arrays that largely look like the arrays we would need to produce for incorrect scatter. In fact, it doesn't take, it takes of order a few hundred to a thousand antennas to start to make beautiful images of the sun all the time if you've got these receiver rates. And it happens completely simultaneous with the right architecture. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is incoherent scatter radar measures a lot more parameters than just the flows. And they're fundamental physics parameters that we don't really have any other way to access other than, say, in situ measurements, which are very sparse. And so um, we really need to think about what's important and how to use our limited resources. Because I, you know, I, I look at it and I go, OK, you want to cover the world, it's a billion dollars. If you build a lot of small radars that each eat a megawatt, it's a lot of power to pay for. If you build one facility that's very large aperture and low power per element, well, that's a whole lot cheaper to run. So these are real trade-offs that we need to quantitatively evaluate and trade off versus the actual measurement performance. And then, you know, the science questions that are underneath it, our community has a lot of good science questions. One of the problems is there's a lot of them, and it's really hard to articulate to people in one sound bite. Anybody else in the panel want to take up Teresa's challenge of the key science questions? I, I just wanted to mention the magnetospheric applications that I mentioned. Um, most of those, I, you know, you were talking, Eric was talking about not looking somewhere for 50 years and then looking back at there again, I will point out that it was 50 years from the first radiation belt measurements to the things that got made in the last few years. And I would say that there's a similar level of discovery class if from a, ge what, what, what's it called, a, a geosynchronous uh, satellite at one RE, um, which some people have called the facility I'm at. Um, you know, if you took that view, again, of the plasmosphere boundary layer, um, 
you start to look at the water cycle of cold plasma in the system you start to look at a lot of system scale effects and i know there's a lot of dynamics in there that i don't think anybody has just begun we've just begun to scratch the surface with it so that's another set of problems i think that you could motivate okay um i was just gonna follow up on that question. I, I was wondering if you could give a little bit more details about the solar radars and what you'd be getting in terms of what you'd be observing and where you'd be observing it and, and so on in respect to, for example, chronograph, heliospheric imagers and, and what are the complementarities? How do they fit together? Well, I guess you get a measurement on, on the solar disk, and, and um, it, it might yield some more information on, on for example, the CME and, and how it's getting launched. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the sort of thing I'm asking. Yeah. That's the hope. That's the hope. I mean, we can't promise that. As well, if you can image it. So, yeah. and I think a point that maybe I didn't realize, appreciate early on, sorry, sorry. was that um, uh, when I first saw Tim's image, <coughs> um, I said, well, geez, the, detecting CMEs in the radio is easy. I mean, why not just, why does a non site just detect thousands of these? And it's because that was a very special case where the noise storm was occulted on the limb. So, just Maybe some people may think, well, you can just routinely uh, image CMEs in synchrotron emission. You, you can't. So, so I, let me just jump in and maybe we can go back to solar radars. So the, talking about the unrealized capabilities, I think super darn radars actually have a meteor radar capability. Is that a fact? Like, I mean, because that's a broad, because I only saw this recently where Pat Espy was showing this and he's got grad students working on it and they're fitting all sorts of different tides in the atmosphere that I never thought you could do from ground because we didn't have enough radars to provide the longitudinal mm -hmm. latitudinal coverage and local time coverage. But we do. I mean, and no one is actually, as far as I know, is no one is using those super darn radars as, as the meteor radars that they apparently can, can be purposed for. So can you comment on that, Bill? Uh, it, it is underutilized. Um, but it has been used a bit. A lot of the stuff that was done at Kodiak, the motivation was actually one of my students to, to get altitude information on the meteor trails, which we, we can get there and can't get elsewhere. But, but yeah, we could, we could get... Just for the Kodiak radar? Or? For, for altitude information on, with good resolution, we can get it at Kodiak, can't get it elsewhere. But so people, when using it, use it like uh, they assume the altitude is some altitude. So you, you get an estimate of the horizontal winds. But it, it's, you know, it's a bunch of locations, it's not continuous coverage. And, you know, there's, there's, you know, the super darn community is, is not the meteor wind community. So I just wrote a, a paper about how to uh, implement a meteor radar using, uh, with, with, together with Koki and, and a bunch of people in Germany, uh, how to implement a meteor radar with 30 watts that's, you know, pretty much as good as the SkyMet system. And, and that Spectra, spectra, uh, spread spectrum signal processing technique might be also useful for uh, super darn as well. Maybe I can talk with you about that. But that that could be used for getting a lot of media trail echoes as a byproduct. Yeah, I wanted to uh, to address Teresa's question because you know my talk is tomorrow. But but you know space weather that occurs in the Earth's environment, right? is a set of, of, of disturbances that occur in our environment, such as substorms, PBIs, streamers, omega bands, what have you. These are the fundamental things that constitute space weather that are the phenomena that do everything that harms anything in terms of a man-made system on space and in the ground. And in order to address those questions and to figure out how they occur, when they occur, and where they occur, and why they occur, we need to make the kind of measurements that Frank, Bill, and, and Eric were talking about. And I'm sure coming up with justification you know, for, for more general consumption is something that could be readily uh, uh, accomplished. Are 
Well, let me uh, jump in a bit in regard to the question of motivation. Uh, I'm surprised that the phrase small-scale dual heating has not uh, come up in this uh, context because this is perhaps one of the primary reasons that you would like to see higher scale resolution uh, in space in regard to the question of trying to identify the reason for uh, significant variability of plasma density that exists and uh, what the relating uh, small scale geoheating effect might be. In regard to the question of variability, there's quite significant amount of evidence suggesting that uh, part of that is the result of uh, scaled uh, wave structures from below, whether uh, gravity waves or tidal waves or planetary waves. Those structures going up producing secondary waves as a result of dissipation within the MLT region and the strong shear and the turbulence that exists in that region somehow leading into secondary waves that go into the uh, upper region of the ionosphere producing variability that we can't quantify because we can't measure it due to the lack of the uh, resolution. Anybody on the panel want to respond? I was reminded over here that that's uh, going to be a major uh, theme tomorrow. Yeah, if I could just make a comment, getting back to your point, Teresa, um, you know, we, we've, we've covered lots of ground today in terms of, you know, the cultures and the instruments and the capabilities and so on. Uh, and I'm sure that each individual group has done this, you know, for a given initiative, namely a traceability matrix. Uh, I think it'd be really useful for this group as a whole to sort of go through that exercise of identifying uh, capabilities needed, the hardware needed to enable those capabilities, and flow them down not only to the fundamental science we want to address, but to loop back to this issue of, you know, we have this opportunity here, namely space weather, uh, to also understand what operational role some of these products may play. Uh, just to see sort of what the landscape looks like and how we might optimize as a community where, you know, we have a limited pot of money or limited pots of money for to make these investments, and, you know, we'd like to get the most bang per buck out of these. I, I, the only thing I would add to that is that I, I think the architectures that you, you are possible today, I mean, Frank showed us a bunch, some of them, I got 3 ds doing some of them. The idea of having multiple science targets happening in a, in, within a single instrument is frankly, I think, the set point that we're at and that we should be at in the future. Somebody else made that point, and I think a little bit earlier in one of the solar sessions, that building a single purpose instrument is just not that saleable, honestly, anymore, and that we should be trying to squeeze whatever drops we can out of it. But I think there's a tremendous amount of information in there. Frank, I to... Oops. So, you know, <laughs> I've, just, I've just gone through this. Uh, you, you, you can talk after me. So it's, I, I've just gone through the gruesome process of doing these, uh, these matrices, these traceability matrices. And, and, you know, they're nice, but they're not the whole story. You also need to have an instrument that's very flexible that allows you to serendipitously discover new things, and, and, and um, that's also important. So I'd like Yuha to put up his uh, Arecibo data, one of the animations at high resolution from some, one of the campaigns you've done at some point in this workshop so people can see it. Uh, we learned this lesson with Arecibo. I mean, you built a radar that for whatever reasons, ended up an order of magnitude larger and more capable than it really needed to be to do the basic measurement in the end. And yet, look at what came out of that. So this lesson of opening up yourself to an instrument that's flexible that can really cover a wide range of things is something we really ought to look back on and say, okay, what was our community's greatest successes? Let's, let's list the three greatest successes in the last 50 years. Okay, so I'll let people think about that. I don't have an answer myself off the top of my head. Yeah, if the RCU had been designed as it should have been, the, the Nobel Prize would not have been awarded for the Taylor And you couldn't measure the, the radar echoes from the rings of Saturn or, or measure beach ball size, um, pulsar pulses. Yeah. All right, and with that, I cut you off because there's beer at stake. <laughs> and we can continue these discussions over beer, and I wholeheartedly endorse that. Okay. Um, Beer's good.
There are maps on the table. It's a 15 minute walk from here. It's a five minute drive. If people have cars, I suggest that they carpool um, because it will get kind of busy over there. So, um, 